Serdecznie witam Państwa na kolejnej części konferencji Zagubiona awangarda Teresa Żarnower i Lewica Artystyczna. Część ta dotyczyć będzie międzynarodowych kontekstów dzieła i biografii Teresy Żarnower. Tę część konferencji prowadzić będzie Pan Profesor Andrzej Szczerski, który w ramach tego, tego naszego spotkania wygłosił referat wczoraj. Profesor Uniwersytetu Jagiellońskiego. Proszę bardzo. Dziękuję. Witam Państwa w drugim dniu konferencji. Żeby już nie przedłużać, to dla mnie wielki przywilej i wyróżnienie, że mogę poprosić o zabranie głosu profesora Serge Kibo, który właściwie nie wymaga wprowadzenia w naszym środowisku i nie tylko, ale chcę tylko przypomnieć, że jego książka Jak Nowy Jork ukradł ideę sztuki nowoczesnej ukazała się w języku polskim właśnie tu w Łodzi i w jakimś sensie pan profesor Gibo wraca do domu, którego jeszcze nie znał. Jego prace na temat sztuki po II wojnie światowej są no, fundamentem studiów nad sztuką europejską i amerykańską, kanadyjską w drugiej połowie XX wieku. Chcę też zwrócić uwagę, że jest kuratorem wystaw, między innymi wystawy poświęconej Teodorowi Jericho. Zajmował się również Henri Matissem. Jest także artystą, o czym może niewiele z nas się dowiedziało i miał swoją retrospektywną wystawę w Vancouver w 2012 roku. Proszę Państwa, Pan Profesor Gibo zajmuje się od niedawna także Andrzejem Wróbelskim, więc to jest jego druga, druga wycieczka intelektualna do Polski, Teresa Czarnower i jej kontekst. Bardzo się cieszymy, że Pan znalazł czas, żeby przyjechać i bardzo proszę o zabranie głosu. Thank you very much. Yes, it is my second time, so I'm pretty excited. Thank you very much for everybody to, uh, to invite me, because it's a, it's a real pleasure and uh, the discussion yesterday was quite uh, exciting, so um, I hope uh, that we can do it again today. So um, about the, um, the title, um, I'm sorry, as you know, I, I like jokes and information, you know, we kind of try to, to say that the inform is a kind of a, a very important uh, movement in, uh, in Paris in the 40s and 50s, so I'd make the joke about this. So um, pretty much what I'm trying to do is to to explain a little bit the um, uh, the, tr the environment in Paris uh, during the uh, post-war period and the difficulty that the artist um, international community even in Paris had to um, uh, reconstruct an image of uh, of uh, Paris and I would say. Uh, part of the discussion we had yesterday is that um, Paris is trying to reconstruct the sense of universalism that was very popular and very strong for the image of Paris. Uh, and as you know, they, couldn't, they cannot succeed, it. they didn't succeed in doing this. Um, and I'm going to try to explain a little bit, it's kind of a bit surveyish, I'm sorry about this, but to try to show the complexity of, a, of discourses that uh, happen uh, in Paris and also I would say the demise of uh, a geometric abstraction, right? What happened and 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 why? So uh, let me start with this and to show you this uh, the importance of the of image uh, in uh, in France at the time. The first thing they did uh, in 1944, where uh, Paris kind of uh, rise and uh, had some kind of a revolution, if you want to say, against German occupation. The first thing they did was to shoot not Hitler, but the portrait of Hitler, that was enough. And so the image it becomes extremely uh, sensitive uh, uh, in, in France at that time. The immediate post-war period was marked in Paris by a long and difficult recreation of a lost paradise at a time when international relations were disintegrating and artistic and cultural productions were becoming crucial in East-West foreign policy as the Cold War set in. It was only in this area, the artistic, that France seemed to be able to find something to root for, to reconstruct a positive image. A cultural image was seen as one of the few instances being helpful in putting the country back on the international stage. The first symbolic action taken by the new government in 1944 
while the, new, while the war was still raging in many parts of the world, was the organization of the by then well-established Salon d'Automne. This was an important event because not only did it celebrate a series of works by younger French artists who developed a renewed, daring Parisian modern style during the occupation, but also because as a symbolic gesture, the Salon that I show you on the, on the screen presented homage to a new communist follower, Pablo Picasso. One full room was devoted to his latest work. The Picasso retrospective at the Salon was a signal, without any doubt, that France, the one coming out of the resistance, spearheaded by the Communist Party, was definitely breaking away from Vichy France and renewing with the values of progress. This fact was important because this treatment put Picasso aside as a symbol of the new era from other important masters like Matisse, Pierre Bonnard, Raoul Dufy, Marcel Gromer, Maurice Briandchamp, also present uh, at, in the Salon. A foreigner was selected to represent the uh, Spanish, to represent the awakening of France. And I'm showing you this Pablo Picasso Obad in 1944, where he, he did this as a kind of a symbol of, uh, uh, of the, the resistance of France, right? Uh, France is asleep, but ready to kind of wake up. So this message of this importance of this foreigner, this Spanish artist, was strong, so clear, and for some, so overwhelming that the exhibition was often disturbed by unrest. In fact, from the reports given by the press, it seems that crowds were immense and at times during the opening totally uncontrollable. In the best tradition of 19th century avant-garde fashion, disturbances occurred in the Picasso's room to the point that police had to be called, as you can see here, uh, in order to protect the works from being destroyed. Some paintings were actually taken off the walls by visitors and some oils damaged, punctured, apparently by kind of bizarre things, by, by uh, students of the Beaux-Arts in Paris. The painter himself received ugly anonymous threats. I forgot to mention that uh, maybe some images are going to be disturbing and here is one of those. The painter himself received ugly anonymous threats in the letter that you can see here on the right side, smeared with faces preserved in his archives, in Picasso's archives, somebody violently attacked his work using strong, disparaging words. It says, quote, Dear Picasso, shit on your filthy painting. Here is some shit taken from the ass of a 60-year-old prostitute. I didn't understand the idea of 60, well, oh, but that's another story. So this is me, I mean. This dangerous attempt to renew the image of Paris was going against a flow represented by the art historian Pierre Franck Castel, who was also, but from a different point of view, reconstructing Parisian artistic power. Franck Castel wanted to use a power based on the, cubis, on the cubism constructed by the French Braque, the patron, the boss, rather than by the Spanish Picasso, the worker, that he was known like this, in order to present a smooth, balanced, traditional image of France. This reconstruction, it was then clear, was not going to be simple as it was easy to see the diversity of aesthetic and political choices being available in this moment of reconstruction. This new image of France was then crucial, but also very sensitive. Witness the problems Django Reinhardt encountered when he played a mild jazz version of the Marseillaise in 1946 after reuniting with his friend Stefan Grappelli. didn't go very well, and the recording was censored as disrespectful and banned. So fragile were those national symbols that even the heavenly fingers of those two elegant musicians could not be allowed to play with them, even touch them. 
those, those symbols. So one can imagine that Picasso's un antics and fame were cautiously received by a large majority of, of art critics. The crucial question for the French art world, though, was what kind of image was appropriate for an international re-inclusion? Despite France's high hopes, things were not going smoothly due to some se uh, severe fractional and violent division, not only in the political sphere, but also in the cultural one. Art critics, writing from heavily politicized newspapers, that's we have to remember they were already uh, politicized, were defending and trying to impose different aesthetics according to their political vision for a new post-war world. While France, like Italy, was becoming a crucial a site for propaganda by the two new major post-war defining forces, Russia and the US. Caught between the two, French culture was like the red ribbon on the middle of the rope in a tug of war contest, passing alternatively from one side to the other in a deadly but often subtle competition. What was at stake for France, having lost almost everything, including a large part of her honor during the occupation, was her image, her cultural past and present. Due to a, a multiplicity of well-defined positions and politically defined, she often presented this image in baffling ways. Indeed, this became quite clear in 46, for example, when two symbolic exhibitions were sent to the US right after the liberation by the government in order to re-establish French presence in the new peaceful world. One of modern painting, which was badly received in the States, and one of fashion, which had a great success. The cliches were, were some cliches were still working. What was clear to many French intellectuals from 1947 onward, when the Communist Party was kicked out of the Ramadier government, was that the political situation was becoming more desperate every day, even very cold indeed. Here is the historian Maurice Duverger writing in Le Monde in September 48, quote, between the Sovietized Europe and the Atlantic Empire, the second solution is clearly preferable because in the first instance, slavery would be certain, whereas in the second case, war would only become probable. Should circumstance dictate this dilemma, we would choose the, the least terrible alternative. But since we are not conclusively locked in, a third solution remains, that's a neutral Europe." End of quote. This type of pragmatic position was also taken by the surrealist revolutionnaire communist poet d'Autremont, when asked what he would do if Soviet troops arrived in Paris, he answered in his famous dialectical fashion, quote, well, of course, I'd take the first plane for America, end of quote. Art production was caught in this nightmare. So what could be done in order to restore in a new modern way the image of Paris? So I have one little part called After the Fall, New Solution for Modern Painting. So these is, those are kind of solutions organized by Fougeron and the Communist Party in France, a kind of a new type of realism. Uh, I, don't, I don't have time to go into, into this, but it's quite interesting as well. Uh, another solution is also Georges Mathieu, uh, this type of uh, abstraction, uh, like lyric, lyrical abstraction. This is a, a series of images that I wanted to show you about that show that was very successful in, in uh, the States. It was like a group of... Uh, uh, models, but uh, the French uh, didn't have enough money to send um, real models. So what they did, I didn't have enough uh, uh, um, tissue to, not tissue, uh, clothing, you know, to uh, cloth to send. So they did uh, little models like uh, puppets or dolls, and they were sending that, and, and they were all, you know, beautifully done and uh, by major designers. Shoes were produced, like for those dolls, and so on and so on. Look at this, and this is the uh, the the decoration was made by Cocteau, by famous uh, designers. Uh, sorry, so uh, and that was very successful. As soon as the image of the Holocaust hit the newsstands in 1945, here's an image of uh, by Lee Miller about uh, the opening of some of those uh, camps. It was clear that the danger was the, in the spectacularization of the carnage. Uh, this particularly chilling photograph shot, shot by Lee Miller in, for Vogue magazine attest. 
Being there at the opening of the camps in Germany, Lee Miller presents us with an astonishing image of a tourist soldier group gazing at a pile of bodies neatly packed in the shape of a cube laid out for investigation. The group not only looks at them, but chatters, laughs, wonders, all the while a friendly GI is taking a picture of this new exotic environment. This gives us an idea of what artists were confronted with. This was the abyss of representation. How to paint after this, we know this. I will focus here on the painter Jean Fautrier, who confronted this problem quite early, along others that for time's sake I will omit, like Vols, Bram van Veld, or Soulage. Fautrier's attempt is all the more interesting in his desire to keep the tradition alive while shifting the mode of representation filtered through his expressionist experience of the 1920s. And I'm showing, I'm going to work a little bit on Fautrier because it, it explains a little bit why geometric abstraction was not uh, considered by the new generation as any, uh, of, of any interest. Fautrier's uses of an abstracted vocabulary manages to avoid falling into the spectacular while being able to talk to a viewer virtually stuck in the mud and sticky ground along with the remnants of violated bodies. That is certainly why the reviewer Chevalier thought in 1944 already that these pictures by Fautrier were, quote, the first real important representation of the war, end of quote. The importance of these pictures come from the fact that our imagination is irrevocably invaded by those flat-faced shapes until those severed heads become ours, covering our profiles, until we feel our own flesh becoming sweaty and wrinkled, experience the decay, the rot. It is right away understood that we will be leaving the room with those moon faces attached to ours like a mask. Obviously, we are all guilty. This bodily relation with the viewer seemed for many at the time to be the only way to represent his unnameable horror, even if, and maybe because, it created an irrepressible uh, fascination. Fautrier's pictures are not a description of torture per se, but a record of it. It is a record of the humiliation, humiliation of the body. Painting in Fautrier's hand can still produce knowledge, but no longer through public transparent display, no longer through the spectacularization of visual propaganda, like Fougeron, for example, but rather through an ambiguous self-awareness of the pitfalls and dangers of representation, rather through bodily reactions attached to reality. And this should not be seen an attack against the grand tradition of painting, because Fautrier is the one in France who, rather than trumpeting the end of art, like Vols or Bram van Velde, for example, still believes, like Soulage and Hans Hartung, uh, in the importance of continuing the task of modern painting. Those pictures really stuck, struck a chord with many intellectuals who were desperately looking for a form capable of comprehending humanity because they want to be less propagandistic manner than the Communist Party and its subordinated poets trumpeting a nauseous neo-nationalism at the time. For poets like Ponge and Pollan, art had to avoid being at the service of politics at all costs. As the still communist sympathizer Francis Ponge realized, what was important was to rearticulate a language, a detached one, a detached one, far from oration or nationalist tones, while at the same time being concerned and engaged. Fautrier, for some, seemed to be the solution. And this is, uh, this is by the way, the, the kind of art that uh, uh, the, the French establishment was pushing, uh, even rather than Fautrier, by the kind of a mixture between uh, Matisse color and Picasso uh, shapes. And so they, they thought that if we can uh, ally the two big heroes, we will for sure uh, have the, the best painting in the world. What they didn't realize is that those people were still continuing the tradition of like a, a very sweet pictures, like uh, still lives and kids, babies, and things like that. And, uh, or this kind of abstraction, which I'm going to, uh, the geometric plan. In October 1st, 1946, Edouard Jaguer, a surrealist influenced art critic, wrote an important article in the socialist newspaper, Juin. His article was trying to define a new language Again, everybody's trying to do that. A new language able to articulate modernity. This language had to be separated from the old experimentations, including the utopian forms celebrated by geometric abstraction. 
Kandinsky and Hans Hartung's earlier experimentations were supposed to show the way. What was clear from him was that he did not understand the rational framework in which the artist ground uh, around the Salon des Realités Nouvelles, which was the salon presenting geometric abstraction at that time, we are working. This is what he said, quote, confronted with these cheerful or austere mosaics, geometric abstraction, we stay indifferent, apart from the pleasure of the eye, he says. In no way do these decorative elements relate to our apocalyptic age. We cannot recognize ourselves in them, end of quote. Geometric abstraction had been a powerful language in Paris before the war, but had almost uh, lost almost all its glitter due to its scientific image in an age interested in expressionism and existentialism. Confronting the strong presence of the art assimilated in the, so in the uh, old school of Paris and defended almost exclusively by the old establishment, several currents were, were simultaneously trying to be visible. Again, 1946 was a key year for this nascent trench war. For many, it was primordial to retrieve the modern force of abstractions. Denise René, for example, opened her gallery to this uh, progressive style in opposition to the jeune peintre uh, de tradition française like Bazaine and Steph Sanger that I just showed you before, who continued to cover figuration with all over abstract patterns, often laced with spiritual overtone uh, as, uh, like these in the works of Bazin and Manissier, for example. Very soon, even in the most abstract circles, a split occurred between those who, like uh, Herbin here and Marie Raymond, wanted a complete adherence to abstract geometry and those who thought it important to accept a dose of lyricism in order to reflect the newly discovered importance of the individual who was being squeezed out by the authoritarian control, not only of the communist, and fascist regimes, but also by the nascent consumerist culture. If the early exhibitions of abstract art at the Denis René Gallery in 46 presented a, a wide array of abstract expression, from De Van, Derol, Marie Raymond to Artung and Schneider, it soon became impossible to sustain such a liberal eclecticism because it became politically important to differentiate between an abstraction signifying an individualistic expressionism and another expressing an ideal uh, reality rationally constructed to propose a coherent utopian common social space. The new Salon des Realités Nouvelles reflected this dilemma, and when it opened in 46, it allowed a multitude of abstract experimentation, but it rapidly became the stage for the presentation of a radical geometric concrete art, which some found too dry and authoritarian. Since August, Urbain's regime denied the inclusion of any curvilinear shape in geometric expression. This was already too much. This, pres this prescriptiveness soon disenchanted many young artists who saw it as a creeping academization, something like this, out, out of art d'aujourd'hui, which was finally formalized in 1950 with the creation of an academy of abstract art by Edgar Pillet and Jean de Vannes. The other side of the square, so to speak, is the vehement, uh, there is a vehement confrontation. By 1950, the modern art scene in France had become extremely polarized. Léon de Gand, writing for the new magazine Art d'Aujourd'hui, was still defending rationalism, geometry, and formalism. Charles Etienne, in clear opposition, moved towards a new expressionist type of abstraction he saw coming out of automatic surrealism, and Michel Tapier, who was influenced by Dada, was trying to put together a group of unaffiliated artists under a generic but well-marketed tiles like informel or art autre, another type of art. The strength of this art autre lays in its violent tone, in the Dadaist-inspired phrases which appeared to bring new life to the idea of a total individual subversion which surrealism no longer seemed able to produce. The very format of the manifesto called uh, Vehemence Confronté displayed its true colors. It was a large poster with text about art printed in red on one side, a list of artists and theoretical text, and on the other side, a black diagram showing the different components of a new art form manipulated by Tapier, 
which formally shunted the despised black square of abstract formalism off in a corner. Black dot representing the individual position of artists like Vols, Pollock, Riopel, floated gaily out from each side of the two axes, vertical and horizontal, in radical opposition to the black square symbolizing the imprisonment of geometry. Red and black, the anarchist revolt and the communist red were in the, on the birth of this new revolution concocted by Tapier. This definition of the contemporary artist, the individualism so relentlessly favored by Tapier became clearly delineated during the Cold War, just at the time when Western culture was obliged to choose between those who defended freedom, the West, and, who's, and, tho and those who defended peace, the East. That was the only time, I think, in our history that we had to choose between peace and, uh, and freedom. I mean, that was, uh, that was kind of an interesting war of words. Tapier was inclined to defend a mythical sort of individualism against any incursion by social concern. He considered that the, the Dada revolt had given modern art its valid direction, while others like Charles Etienne and certain surrealists who were more utopian preferred to defend a more socially responsible individualism. I would say the idea of the individual that they were defending is the idea of individual without individualism. Because of their desire to break the material and ideological bonds which still imprison mankind. Tapier stands thus ran counter to a powerful school of thought in Paris, which used the political awareness of artists amid a wide variety of means to raise the public's, or at least the artistic public, consciousness. We must recall here that the idea of the public, and even of public service, was one of the key features of post war culture although it remained a totally alien concept of tap, to Tapier, who resolutely defended individualism versus the, quote, what he called, quote, the great public herd, which is always wrong, end of quote. So we have the difference between the two, two art critics, very violent dif difference. With this text, Tapier succeeded in placing himself in the front line of contemporary art, claiming to integrate and represent all that was new and therefore incomprehensible to common mortals. So I, something I called a uh, French counterattack. Now that uh, loose abstraction was becoming the style of choice, the personal and political feud between two Parisian art critics intensified. Michel Tapier and Charles Etienne, and Léon de Gaulle was, was rejected, but Michel Tapier and Charles Etienne fought a series of famous paroxysmal battles in the press. What was at stake, as Charles Etienne understood it, was the need for a new French identity rooted in a long glorious past, but armed with contemporary clout. Charles Etienne, by resizing surrealist concepts in order to recoup a forgotten basic human revolt, if not revolution, was trying to salvage the concept of the school of Paris. He saw this, as he put it, as, quote, the only path between the political messianism of the Communist Party and the pessimism of the philosopher of the absurd. Charles Etienne, with the help of André Breton, decided to take a different route than Tapier and started digging deep into France's past, where he found a connection between, surprising as it may sound, the art of the Celts and his new abstract style, le tachisme, which was opposing the various foreign drips proposed by Tapier. The, this is what the, uh, um, Breton and Charles Etienne were interested in. They discovered uh, after a big show in Paris of, the, of Kells coins, they realized that uh, the Kells were kind of original and interesting because they, they produced coins like they were at the opposite of the, of the, uh, uh, the Greek coins. They are well more abstract. And so they were, in their text, they were talking about the fact that the Greek, they resemble America, the powerful power, and the Celts are kind of the revolutionaries, the abstract kind of destroying of the tradition of the, of the, of the Greek. So, I mean, it's kind of, you have to kind of dig, dig deep into French history to kind of find the roots of abstraction uh, in France, right? So the, the opposition was tough, and our autre uh, I want to show you this. The opposition of Tapier uh, to this kind of idea was tough. And art, as they call the other art, 
orchestrated from 1951 by Michel Tapier and advertised by the painter Georges Mathieu, for example, was an international structure in which a, a stable of modern artists from around the world, including contradictory ones like Pollock and Toby, were grouped under the umbrella of a rekindled Paris. Together, they published the magazine The United States Line Re Paris Review for a luxury transatlantic liner on which Tapier and Mathieu lectured on, quote, the vitality and grandeur of our Western civilization on both sides of the Atlantic, end of quote. The deluxe, this deluxe magazine aimed at a well-to-do travelers defended a very abstract vocabulary based on contemporary research and complicated philosophical constructions. Sometimes when you read uh, Michel Tapier, uh, you don't understand a word of what he says. The text is such that when they tried to translate it American, the American translator said, I cannot do it, right? It didn't make sense whatsoever, but the beautiful abstract words. So, for example, I'm showing you here the, the two different one on one, yeah, Mathieu with his uh, fancy car, uh, aristocratic, very un a fancy car. And on the other side, you have Charles Etienne, the opposer, who uh, does not, is not interested in big liners going to America, but is more interested in Brittany, in the small uh, sailboat, right? That, so they have the two different types of, uh, uh, of action here. This deluxe magazine aimed at, well, as I said, well, uh, defended, um, sorry, this deluxe magazine aimed at well-to-do travelers defended a very abstract vocabulary based on contemporary research and complicated philosophic construction. For Mathieu, the past, what he called classicism, was over, and a new world was coming up, opening up, based on a sharp consciousness of the present, which was emerging simultaneously in the US, um, the modern country par excellence. And that's what, um, uh, 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 not Charlotte, Tapier was trying to do by selecting all around the world artists that he liked and he put them together even if they didn't make sense because they were all talking about different things. But he managed to kind of create a sense that uh, the world was coming to Paris again and under his umbrella it will be a universal kind of uh, statement. On the other hand, it seems that both Charles Etienne and André Breton were really surveying over an independent space where the critic from Brittany, Charles Etienne, proudly displaying his roots, a vaunted French tradition symbolized by his small sailboat against a gigantic transatlantic liner supported by the aristocratic Tapier and Mathieu, who seemed to him to have sold their souls to the most powerful interest of the moment, America. This was the losing battle, of course, and Etienne rapidly abandoned what he felt was a corrupt art world for the Breton, the Breton coast, where between trips in his sailboat, he wrote popular lyrics for the anarchist singer Léo Ferré. So he dropped out of the, of the art world, which was kind of interesting. André Breton and Charles Etienne, in their stubborn utopian independence, looked a lot like Asterix and Obelix, who refused to buckle down under the powerful mechanization of the empire, knowing full well that victory was out of the question, but that for self-preservation, cultural difference had to be protected. Neutralism seemed to be for some an, accept an acceptable solution as André Philippe, the socialist minister of economy, was signaling in 1950, quote, Europe is weakened today as after a long and painful illness. To this thick person, Americans sent penicillin, penicillin and the Soviets microbes. Naturally, it is a doctor which we prefer, but our goal as European is to push out microbes as soon as possible so there is no need of a doctor." End of quote. The end. 1955-1956 uh, are crucial years defining a new sort of world and the end of the old one. And this is not only because James Dean and Jackson Pollock died on car crashes or because Nicolas de Stael in a romantic gesture committed suicide by jumping out of his studio towards, towards the, whoops, why is it going on? towards the Mediterranean Sea in Antibes, but also because this was the year when a certain idea of the left 
of revolution, of utopia, crashed in the streets of Hungary. Nothing in France seemed to be the same after this dramatic event. All the symbolic potential gathered by the Communist Party since the war evaporated in a single week or in a single night. The forced retreat of British and French troops from the Suez Canal under US pressure also signaled a new type of world in which all colonial powers had to rethink their overall influence. The balance of power was going to be very different this time while a new type of revolution was taking place, consumerism. This immediately provoked virulent opposition from a generation raised on surrealist criticism. Debord, Van Egen, Le Maître, Izu, and so on were now on the war path against what they perceived as a totalizing and alienating culture. The modern art that the post-war generation had defended so unrelentingly through although often without much hope, was now ridiculed by a generation who would not accept the statu quo. Soon the cultural scene was split in two. On the one hand, art turned from expression to either a form of philosophical and critical detached silence or vitriolic irony. On the other, a radical critique of the art scene was constructed and a violently politically articulated art scene took its place. Suddenly, the struggle, the violence, the personal tortured investment of the abstract expressionist and peinture lyrique of the painters of silence like Vols, Bram van Veldegen gave way to blindness, to blindness, to Yves Klein early monograms or Rochemberg white paintings. The social and utopian geometric space was transformed into a Dadaist revision by Tingeli, making fun of both abstract expressionist and geometric abstraction, but mechanizing them in numerous contraptions. Nikit Safal uh, applied the coup de grace by shooting at targets in order to produce through their bleeding pseudo abstract expressionist paintings. Virility was deconstructed and so was the old exalted sincere expression. The last straw was the production by the meter by Pino Galizio of rows of abstract expressionist paintings as dress material for cool fashionable avant-garde women as where a world was passing by. Also, by 1955, Denise René, sensing the change, opened her exhibition space to uh, Le Mouvement uh, show with, with Agam, Bury, Calder, Duchamp, Jacobsen, Soto, and so on. An exhibition where humor and fun finally penetrated the old geometric abstraction. Paris was ready for this new experimental art and his participatory technique the Latin American artist arrived just in time to help the grim post-war French public realize that life could be fun, even if they were buying another Orientalist cliché, uh, the cliché of Latin America. But all this is another story, another mixed story that I don't have to, to, to talk about. But the, the world changed and America uh, com, uh, came in into the, the European culture uh, but not the way the American State Department wanted, for example. They, they wanted to, to have a, a high culture, uh, so Pollock was the, the guy they really wanted to, to send. He had some success, but you know, it was complicated, that's another story. But what was interesting was that the State Department didn't realize that po uh, popular culture won the day. And uh, as I said, uh, it's popular culture music, popular music, who won Elvis Presley, uh, and uh, 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 Cl Little Richard were the one who really won the day. And, and as I said, I finished with this, and, uh, and Little Richard said in 1956, um, he says in Tutti Frutti, uh, he said, you know, and what ba ba lo ba ba la bam boom, and that was it, man. I mean, they won, the Americans won the hearts and the brains of the Europeans. So uh, this is what uh, th that I was talking about. This um, uh, for the show at the um, Denis René show, the the, the French uh, really had it to uh, transform what we call geometric abstraction into uh, into joy, into not anymore into utopia, but just fun to counteract and to go to get along with the new consumerist culture. So look at this. This is what we end up with, and this is the end. Thank you very much. Dziękujemy bardzo za wprowadzenie tego 
nowego kontekstu do naszej dyskusji o Teresie Żarnowej i jej czasach. Teraz proszę o zabranie głosu Marka Bartelika. So we postpone the questions until the, the end of the session. Marek Bartelik jest krytykiem i historykiem sztuki, szefem ICA International. Wykłada w Nowym Jorku na Cooper Union historię sztuki nowoczesnej i współczesnej. W Polsce jest przede wszystkim znany jako krytyk sztuki i poeta. Jego tomik Łagodny też ukazał się kilka lat temu w języku polskim, chyba dwa lata temu. Marek Bartelik współpracował przez ponad 20 lat z czołowymi pismami krytycznymi w Stanach Zjednoczonych, w tym Art in America czy Art Forum. Jest autorem szeregu książek, w tym książki o polskiej sztuce przełomu wieków Early Polish Modern Art, która okazała się nakładem Manchester University Press w 2005 roku. Ostatnio zorganizował wystawę Marka Rotko w Warszawie w ubiegłym roku, zaliczoną do tych najważniejszych wydarzeń artystycznych w Polsce w ubiegłym roku. Aktualnie jako szef AIK też prowadzi bardzo ważną reorganizację tej instytucji. Bardzo się cieszymy też za to, że Marek zdecydował się być kuratorem tej konferencji, ale o tym już mówił wczoraj Jarosław Suchan. Także oddaję Ci głos i proszę. Dziękuję Andrzeju za, za tak e, piękne wprowadzenie. Ja przejdę na angielski, teraz mój referat jest po angielsku, więc e, e, chciałem tylko może po polsku powiedzieć, że będzie to dosyć ciekawe chyba zderzenie, mianowicie mówimy o dwóch okresach, bo ja będę mówił o latach dwudziestych w Nowym Jorku i o recepcji konstruktywizmu, więc w zasadzie jest, są to dwa etapy. Profesor Ogibo mówił o, o, o latach czterdziestych i pięćdziesiątych, czyli jak gdyby tam, gdzie, gdzie Żarnower już nie ma, ona została w Nowym Jorku, mówimy, mówiliśmy o Paryżu, prawda? Ja będę mówił o jak gdyby okresie przed Żarnower, przed pojawieniem się Żarnower w, w Nowym Jorku, czyli o tym, jak, jak konstruktywizm został przyjęty w pierwszych latach, kiedy pojawił się na arenie międzynarodowej. A, więc przejdę może teraz na angielski. The title of my presentation is Russian Constructivism Arrives in the United States uh, and uh, I chose those three kind of categories which in a way define uh, the way how it was received when it arrived in New York uh, mainly. So it's commercialization, politicization and individualization. And um, I guess the images that I presented here, it's a little bit a joke, but it's, uh, it's, it's that um, painting by Malevich on, 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 on your left side, right? And on the right side is one of the covers from, uh, from the New Yorker, which was done by a Russian artist. I will talk about him later. Uh, okay, so uh, in the late 1960s, when modern American art celebrated its full originality, viewed as distinct from its European predecessors, blurring the boundaries between the distinct uh, fractions of innovative art created shortly after and uh, before and after the 1917 revolution in Russia, the artist George Ricci observed the following in his um, uh, seminal book on international constructivism, and I'm quoting. Supposedly invented by the Russian artist Vladimir Tatlin, who assembled corner constructions in 1914, it is one of those words which became technical, uh, technical terms without ever having been defined. It was uh, carefully skirted by Tatlin's compatriot, uh, Naum Gabo, who always used the more generic term constructive for, we, uh, for his uh, art instead of constructivist. And that's the uh, end of the quote. What this short statement shows uh, is the fact that despite its original, original specificity as both theory and practice, after the term constructivism landed in the United States, 
it underwent, uh, it underwent skirting rather than assembling, and as such fit the American body in a specific context of its time and place. Uh, to achieve such an optimistic and I would say also necessary goal, constructivism became linked to the concept of uh, migration uh, in terms of migration of artists and uh, migration of ideas, which then led to their successful and constructive uh, naturalization, and I use it in quotation marks. That naturalization being both the adoption of the foreign into general use and granting full um, <coughs> uh, citizenship to one of foreign birth. And for the purpose of this presentation, rather than assembling a continuous and historical narrative of the reception of constructivists in the United States, I will place um, the dynamics of that reception in the context what, uh, and I will sort of contradict what we discussed this morning about the theory as being sort of applied to, um, to the way how we speak about art, what Alain Badieu uh, has called an encounter. So that's our conversation that we had this morning, which does not come just by itself, but clearly belongs to, di to dynamic, the chance element of existence. So I'll be using sort of the encounter as, as a kind of a, a set of references, and um, there are three uh, organizations of three kind of personalities that define that uh, commercialization, politicization, and individualization. So the first one is uh, uh, the Société Anonyme, and uh, I must say one of the problems which comes with presentations, it's always to figure out how much has to be given in, in, as information, especially when we deal with sort of knowledge which is transatlantic, you know, how specific and how general we should be, but I hope I will be somewhere in the middle. So, um, so the, first, uh, the first organization that in a way was implicated in the way how constructivism was uh, presented in the United States and, and kind of politicized was uh, the Société Anonyme. And the history of the Société Anonyme is quite well known, so I will be rather brief and only speak about certain kind of uh, elements of their activities. So, as has been well documented, the Société Anonyme, founded by the artist, collector, and uh, occasional curator, Catherine Dreyer, Man Rai, and Marcel Duchamp, uh, <coughs> played an important role in creating information channels and propagating modern art including Russian constructivism uh, in America from its inception in 1920. When in 1926, uh, Catherine, um, oops, sorry. Uh, when in 1926, Catherine Dreyer wrote in her book, Modern Art, that the aim of the Société Anonyme is educational and to stimul stimulate thought reaction to the world of art like a flowering steam, not a stagnant pool. Therefore, it was met for, for this assemblage to vari various groups which have never been shown here before. She was stating the obvious. Modern art had to educate. As far as assembling, and that's where that Ricky uh, quote is important where he talks uh, different between skirting and, and assembling. As, as far as assembling uh, um, was concerned, it was of foreign individuals, so it wasn't a formal, but rather a sort of personal, as a, as a kind of a group of people who, who created that kind of assembling sort of situation. But the education of, uh, function of the organization also had a commercial aspect right from the beginning. And when Man, uh, Man Rai picked the name for, for it from a French magazine, assuming that it reflected, um, referred to a generic anonymous society and perceiving it as a play of words, it reflected well the goal of its founding members to launch a commercial endeavor. Société Anonyme in French uh, is in the French term for a corporation. And Duchamp, then an art advisor and art, and uh, as much as an artist, was delighted with uh, 
with the mistake and the misnomer. Subsequently, the legal documents written in English uh, that uh, subsequently the legal documents written in English that establish the art organization call it Corporation Inc. EMC. In terms of dealing with the art of the Russian avant-garde, Dreyer was the first American collector to buy works by Elisitsky and uh, Kazimir Malevich from the Russian uh, exhibition in Berlin in 1922, held under the auspices of the Soviet government. And I think it's quite important that it was an exhibition sponsored by the government. Soon after, works by the Russian artists appeared in various exhibitions in the United States. It seems, however, that in order to export those works to the United States, Dreyer needed to do more than to just simply bring the physical objects with her. She had to detach Russian art from its original context of Soviet Russia. In order to net neutralize, or rather naturalize, the work she brought with her to New York upon her return from her trip to Europe, she wrote, and I'm quoting, the service which, with, uh, which Soviet Russia has rendered the rest of the world has been chiefly that it has scattered most of its creative and living spirits over the world. End of the quote. What at first was presented as a process of dispersion and dislocation of objects in Dreyer's uh, book Modern Art, which she wrote in conjunction with an exhibition I will be speaking about soon, uh, became identified with the fate of specific individuals, almost all of whom lived in the West. His, uh, he, her uh, impression was not completely unfounded, considering the number of Russians living in Berlin at that time, which made the German capital appear full of Germans. In her book, Modern Art, which was dedicated to Kandinsky, she, uh, which accompanied the interna International Exhibition of Modern Art at the Brooklyn Museum 1926, organized by the Société Anonyme, she outlined the theoretical base of the Russian avant-garde and uh, the as derived from the writings of Malievich and the constructivists, but at the same time continued to link the development of Russian art to the displacement of its seminal and less seminal figures. Reiterate, reiterating her earlier phrasing, she opened her chapter on Russian art as follows, and I'm quoting just to show you how um, much she insisted on that sort of idea of displacement. The service with uh, which Ru Soviet Russia rendered to the rest of the world has been chiefly that it has scattered most of its creative and living spirits over the whole world, like the sower sowing his seed so that all might benefit uh, that so that all might benefit by that spiritual contribution with Russia which Russia has to give end of the quote and uh, Dreyer praised uh, Pepsner and Gabo with introducing her to Russian uh, to Russian modern art she also credited them together with Kandinsky with shaping Russian art in the early 20th century in her text, she um, acknowledged the differences between suprematism and constructivism. And I think it's important to state how much uh, she was informed from the beginning and how much she differentiated between different fractions of, uh, of, of the avant-garde in Russia, but described them as so close that it, has, it, it is hard to know where the one ends and the other begins. Those thus homogenizing the Russian avant-garde in, in informal terms. She further uh, argued for displacing constructivists from uh, Soviet Russia by stressing its impact on artists living in the West. She credited the constructivists for taking hold of imagination of many artists, such as Moholinaj, Paladini, and Panagi. She also links suprematists to Mondrian and uh, the Dutch artists associated with him at this, this time. Clearly with the word, the word imagination, which uh, Dreyer capitalized, um, uh, is important here because it suggests the ability of those artists to create new images, not from uh, direct sensual experience, be it through sight, hearing, or touch, 
or direct knowledge, but rather indirectly through storytelling and make-believe. While the Russian representation in the 1926 Brooklyn Museum show clearly reflected a sense of the exodus of Russian artists from, the nat from their native country to the West, the type of art on display uh, blurred the boundaries between modern and pre-modern. Um, oops, I keep doing this. This is, uh, this is, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, so it's going back. Uh, I wanted to show you just uh, Marcel Duchamp with Catherine Dreyer. Uh, this is a late picture from the 30s. And then Catherine Dreyer's uh, abstract painting of Marcel Duchamp, which she did. Uh, um, uh, so this we went. This is the, the, the show at the Brooklyn Museum. There are a few pictures, archival pictures, that survived. So. Um, so while the Russian representation in the, uh, the blur the boundaries between modern and postmodern, as well as innovative and traditional forms, that display was particularly evident in the works of the Russian artists from New York, with works by Archipenko, who came uh, to uh, New York in 1923, David Burluk, uh, he came to New York in 1922, uh, they were modern, however, there were other artists who, uh, who would be hardly considered uh, modern, among them Konstantin Aladjalov, uh, who came to New York in 1923, and Nikolai Tchaikovsky, who came uh, to the U.S. in 1923 as well. They all belonged to the second wave of Russian immigrants, followed by the 1970 revolution, who, unlike the preceding first wave, were not predominantly Jewish. Um, and I'm going to show you, um, I hope I'm going the right way, okay, uh, sorry, a uh, few of those works because in a way, uh, you know, this, this set a, a, a tone for understanding Russian art uh, and taking it away from the original avant-garde as it appeared in the Soviet Russia. So, um, Alajalov, who was a personal friend of uh, Katrin Dreyer, collaborated with her on that book that I mentioned, Modern Art. He, he was uh, born in Baku and emigrated to the United States at the age of 23 in 1923. Uh, when he became involved with the Russian diaspora in New York, one of his first New York projects was um, painting murals for a restaurant which was opened by the Countess Alexandra Konstantinovna von Zarnekau. By, by the mid-1920s, he became illustrator, and uh, he contributed over 70 covers, actually, to The New Yorker. So those are two covers uh, that he, he produced. Uh, he also worked for the Saturday Evening Post and Fortune magazine. He became, so he became also an accomplished book illustrator, and his commercial pro uh, projects included designing rugs for the New York artist and entrepreneur Ra Ralph Pearson. So I'm mentioning the, this kind of variety of activities only to show you, you know, what was the fate of those people who were coming to the U.S. and trying to for, first establish themselves as artists and also survive sort of economically. In a way, it, it, it sort of re relates to, uh, to Teresa Jarnover's sort of the way how she made her way to New York and what were the opportunities available to those people. Uh, the second artist who, uh, who is probably not known to majority of people, not here but everywhere, it's, uh, it's Nikolai Tchaikovsky who was born in Pinsk and uh, after a, a rather short but successful career as a realist painter and educa educator came to New York in 1923 at the, at, at the age of 29. He uh, supported himself mainly by uh, producing theater uh, design and theater uh, stage design and commercial murals. And then he became a, a realist painter in the tradition of uh, Raphael Sawyer, who sort of took a socialist realist into a kind of more lyrical um, um, stage in the 1930s. So these are the pictures that sh just to give you idea the kind of socialist realism he was involved with and this is a picture which uh, is from Long Island which shows you that uh, those people they created their small communities and this was 
predominantly Russian community on Long Island uh, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Um, in fact, as far as the works of the New York-based Russian artists were concerned, the international exhibition of modern art at the Brooklyn Museum did not, and did not add anything uh, new to what could have been seen in the exhibition of Russian painting and sculpture at the same museum three years earlier. There was another museum which focused only on, on Russian art and, and the same kind of um, group of people then participating in the international exhibition. It might be interesting for you also to, uh, to know uh, there was a Polish section in that exhibition and there were two painters who represented Poland. Uh, they were Halicka and Markusi. So again, two artists who lived outside of Poland for quite a while. So. So in a way, the Russian section and the Polish section were composed mainly of artists who lived in exile. Um, the exhibition of the Russian painting and sculpture at the same museum was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, curated uh, by, um, by uh, Christian Britain, who uh, became one of the early promoters of Russian art. And he started going to Russia in the late 19th century. He went back in uh, before the revolution and sort of became a bridge between um, bringing sort of Russian art to the United States and also promoting it uh, both, both commercially and in, in, in museums like the Brooklyn Museum. So the, the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Museum really became a, a place where you could see art uh, coming from, from Europe and Central Europe and uh, Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, Burluk, who was uh, part of that group, actually uh, created a painting which uh, shows uh, uh, Christian Britain in the middle of the painting as this kind of spiritual father or kind of promoter of, of Russian art in, in the United States. And then around him there are a number of uh, artists, uh, their names, you can read them, so it includes uh, artists such as uh, Sudekin, uh, Rarik, uh, Boris Anisfeld, uh, uh, and uh, Burluk himself. So uh, this was uh, actually somebody who wrote about this painting, talks about sort of the early kind of uh, pictorial representation of networking. You know, this is kind of a, a painting of a network of artists. Uh, uh, they all, those all artists, they belong to the second wave of Russian, uh, that's, that's uh, I already mentioned, second wave of artists who came to, to New York. Um, what this exhibition made clear, as uh, Marie Turbo of Lampard has written, is that they, those, art, they, those artists, they promoted uh, those exhibitions, promoted the work of group of artists who formed a network of immigrant artists uh, struggling to establish themselves in New York. In order to respond to, to, to the then prevailing taste among the American public, those newly arrived Russian, Russians produced a figurative kind of colorist art reminiscent also of set design. And I think that's also important that one of the ways how Russian artists actually managed to enter into the, the art scene, the local art scene, was through, or th through theater more than through uh, sort of fine arts kind of channels. Um, and then uh, to, uh, to relate to the, the whole commercial aspect, because that's the, the section which, which I wanted to present, the way how Russian art becomes kind of uh, commercialized is, uh, is a story about uh, Duchamp, who, as I mentioned, was very much involved uh, with the Société Anonyme as, uh, as a, as a marcher, a marchant as much as, as an artist. So when in 1921 he, um, he designed uh, a, a, an advertisement in arts magazine for uh, for Archipenko. He, 
I, unfortunately, I don't have it, but uh, the, the image. But he, the way how he fragmented the, the, the name of the artist, he put Archipenko, and there is CO, which is corporation again. So sort of making the name of the artist into a brand, kind of a commercial brand. So uh, uh, I think the whole involvement of Duchamp in promoting and commercializing actually uh, European art is quite interesting. He was very much involved also with uh, uh, bringing uh, Eli, Eli Nadelman to 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 to, uh, to New York uh, through Societe Anonyme. So this is one one of those vectors that I thought it's important to understand how constructivism was brought to the United States and what how it differed from what was happening with the same reception, let's say, in the rest of Europe. Uh, the the other person who was uh, very a uh, person. Uh, a single per person who was very involved with that kind of um, promotion was Louis Lozovic, um, who um, who was a close associate to, uh, of Catherine Dreyer, and uh, he came to the U.S. actually quite early. He came in 1906 uh, when he was only 14, um, and established sort of very direct uh, communication with uh, with the Russians. He went to uh, to Europe in in the 1920s uh, to France, Germany, and Russia. He visited Russia in the summer of 1922, where he met Tatlin, Stefanova, um, Popova. He also saw uh, Mayer Holtz, uh, the magnificent uh, uh, cockold, uh, which uh, with the set designed by Lubov Popova. Um, so, in the publications of, of the Societe Anonyme, uh, he used uh, those uh, publications in order to promote uh, Russian Dadaists, uh, for example, Kruchennik, uh, about whom he argued that have been writing longer than their analogous in America and France, sort of putting the Russian Dadaists in front of and the other uh, Dadaist. In 1923, in a note on modern Russian art published in a February issue of uh, Broom, and that's the, the cover of the magazine, uh, Lozovic praised the Soviets for giving a great impetus to artistic efforts by inaugurating a program of ref reform on a scale hardly paralleled in any other modern state and Russian artists for active engagement in producing art theory. And that's something very important too, that from the beginning, you know, when the art was commercialized, there was also a, a lot of emphasis on, on, on the fact that it came with art theory, that it wasn't just a, a visual expression, but it had a very strong uh, uh, component in, in, in theory. So, uh, Lozovic went a little bit further than uh, Dreyer in his uh, definition of the development of Russian art. So he went back to the wanderers, to the Russian realists from the mid 19th century. Then he he went to Archip uh, to Rodchenko. He talked about his monochromes, about blue, yellow, and red. He uh, he talked about uh, Malievich. He talked about Kandinsky. And at the end, uh, when he made his conclusion about the development of, of Russian art, he did the same thing that Catherine Dreyer did. Mainly, he, he credited Archipenko and Kandinsky for being the most important Russian artists, and therefore, again, sort of putting weight on those artists who are already outside of Russia, rather than crediting artists who stayed in Russia for uh, development of, uh, of, of Russian art. So. Um, he is uh, also the way how he dealt with uh, with a sort of iconography of constructivism. Uh, uh, he used uh, the cover from uh, that mag Lishitsky's magazine that uh, was mentioned already yesterday, and sort of created a similar cover for his book, which is a book on on on, on modern Russian art, which he did in 1925. By the way, the same year when. Uh, uh, Mayakovsky came to uh, to New York for the first time, and um, 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 the the book, the Modern Russian Art uh, book, was was an expan expanded version of the text that he published in that magazine, Broom. Um, 
Lozovic's interest in applied arts, because he was not only interested in, in and that's an interesting moment, when a constructivist sort of takes on a, on a specific meaning when it gets um, um, extended into applied arts uh, in, in the United States, uh, theater and technology, uh, found uh, Lozovic uh, sort of combine all, all those interests in a realization of a stage design, which he did. Um, uh, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, I do it with my students too all the time. They drive me crazy. So uh, I'm going to show you the the, the 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 stage design that he produced for, and then we'll go back to this is this is it. So in 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 1926, he's. He designed this uh, this um, set for um, a play, uh, which was staged in in Chicago. Um, it, uh, uh, this was a play by the German playwright Georg Kaiser, uh, and the title of that play was Gaz. Uh, it was presented at the Kenneth Sayer Goodman Theater in Chicago in early 1926 and was built as a kind of a dramatic novelty, not only in terms of, of the, the subject of the play, which in, in itself is very interesting, but also in terms of the design, or the, the theater design. Uh, so um, what's also interesting that uh, in the announcement for that play, Lozovic was presented as a Russian artist, and I think that's, that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, subject in itself, how those artists were Change their identity depending on the on the context and whether it was better to be a Russian artist or American artist or whatever uh, whatever their nationality was. Uh, but uh, but it, it constantly kind of went back and forth between uh, between uh, this identity of of somebody who comes to the United States who become citizen, but at the same time, sometimes it's Russian, sometimes it's American. In this context, it was better to present him as, as Russian. Um, okay. Uh, so, as it is clear from those, uh, from those pictures, I guess, for, uh, uh, that uh, he, he knew very well what, what, how, how stage design was, what stage design was produced in, in Russia and sort of produced his own version of it. What was interesting also in the reception of, of that, 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 that play is that uh, um, people, rather than seeing it as a, as a kind of echo of Russian design, actually, they, they, they immediately sort of uh, address the issue of how it reflects sort of American uh, context that it's it, it has the form is maybe it's Russian but the con uh, the content and the context which is outside of the theater was very much immediately kind of understood as as American. The play it's in, in itself it's 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 very interesting because um, it it is um, it is a play which uh, which uh, sort of has this utopian idea of. Um, uh, a person who commits commits crimes, and in order to reinvent himself, he he sort of stages. Uh, uh, um, he becomes uh, a double of a worker, so he, he, he becomes... Actually, I realize that's, that's the same uh, story which is in one of the Fassbinder's movies where this uh, character kind of stages suicide and then reappears as a new character again in, in the future. So, um, So, okay, maybe here I should say. Like the character Kaiser's play, The Choral, part of a trilogy along with Gas and Gas II, those plays that uh, were staged in Chicago, who kills a man who looks exactly like him and assumes that man's identity in order to suppress his sense of guilt for the horrors committed earlier in his life and move on, Lozovic needed to produce an optimistic double of a um, uh, double in America and a new, a new embodiment of himself or, or self. 
In his art, the Dabu developed uh, imagery that merges modern art, design, and technology with the, its preoccupation with streamlined, uh, streamlined products from everyday use, which moved him away from the works of the Russian avant-garde. That approach labeled, um, and I think I have to go back, uh, in the United States, uh, it has been lab labeled differently, pre precisionist and considered indi indigenous to the United States, become, became, among other things, of, uh, because of its focus on the skyscraper and the suspension bridge. Um, and what Lozovic did, actually, and that's quite interesting, too, he, the way how he then deals with constructivism, uh, he creates uh, this machine ornaments, uh, which he produces between 1923 and 1930, which were originally called uh, compositions or decorations. What makes those images stand out is not so much their geometric, hard edge, highly controlled character, which with visible machine components, but the fact that they carry the world ornament in their title, as opposed, for example, to Kandinsky's compositions or Picabia's mechanomorphics or Leger's uh, mechanical elements. Rather than seeing a uh, machine as the soul of a uh, modern world, as Picabia proclaimed in 1915, Lozovics brings its quality to the surface of the images. Interestingly enough, to render those surfaces um, photorealistic, he base his imagery on photographs from art and literary journals such as Broom, L'Esprit Nouveau, Ma, and their style, those enhancing the mechanical qualities through mechanical reprodu reproducibility. Still, Lo Lozovic inter interpreted machine ornaments as decorative patterns similar to those of flora and fauna, fauna which tend to be concentric, asymmetric, and repetitive. Um, by the 1920s, actually, his style, uh, late 1920s, his style becomes to evolve, and that's where uh, one of those uh, directions to how um, constructivism evolves in the United States. It's, 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 it's interesting that it becomes more and more literal, so those uh, ornaments become more like uh, buildings that can be recognizable, and finally he he moves into, uh, into a stage where he becomes a uh, uh, socialist realist where, oops, ay, 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 sorry, uh, where after those uh, stage design that, that his work becomes uh, basically socialist realist. In the 19, late 1920s, he becomes involved with a publication called New Masses. And this is one of his designs uh, that he produces in 1928, which still has that kind of constructivist feel to it. Then uh, New Masses moved towards a kind of more uh, figurative socialist realism, and this is one of the covers uh, later. Uh, what, what interests me in Lazovic, and I think in a way it also uh, coincides with the, with, the, with the situation of Teresa Jarnova, that there is there is a vocabulary, there is this language of constructivism that he, he explores, and at the same time there is another Lozovic uh, who is uh, a more private one, who is uh, very much interested in, in sort of his Jewish roots. And, uh, and that's also where um, there are certain um, contacts being established, not through uh, the, the constructivist circles, not even through Lisitsky and so on, but through the contacts between the different Jewish groups and uh, Lozovic, uh, when he was in, in Berlin in 1920 and 1922, when there was the exhibition of Russian art, actually may, met Berlevi in, and um, his, uh, his, uh, um, his uh, works appeared in, in, in publications like Albatros, which was first published in Warsaw and then moved to Berlin. Um, there were, he was one of several people who created this kind of bridge between the, the Polish, early Polish avant-garde and the American kind of modernist uh, tendencies. Another, ones were, another one was uh, 
Jenkins Yehuda Toffel, who wrote about the Young Yiddish group uh, uh, in, in a magazine ca called Schriften, uh, where he published some of the illustrations by, uh, by Berlevi, but also by uh, people like uh, Browner, Marek Schwartz, and uh, next to those people, Lozovic was one of those, uh, was those artists. So there is, um, uh, along those uh, channels of communication, which were actually, uh, and we talked about this yesterday, I think, which were kind of quicker in some way than the other one, the, 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 the Jewish publications actually very quickly informed about what was happening in, in, in Łódź or, or in New York or in Berlin. The other publication which was very important was the, the Kaliastre, which is, called, I think it's, it's, the name is uh, The Gang. Which, uh, which also pub published text, uh, sort of illustrations and, and texts by Berlevi, by Tchaikov, by Brau Browner and Lozovic. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's the second sort of component. The, the third component, which I found uh, perhaps the most contemporary and sort of interesting and deals with the uh, idea of identity and individualization is the, the story of the publication which was called The Little Review. And uh, the main character uh, who, they, they were two women who were at one time, they were lovers and then they separated. Uh, um, uh, Jane Heap and Margaret Anderson. So Margaret Anderson creates this, uh, this uh, review, this um, uh, magazine in Chicago in 1914. Then it is, uh, it is brought to New York where Jane Heap actually it takes over the magazine. And I think she's very important in a way because she, she's the one who brings uh, uh, modern art to the magazine. Uh, uh, Anderson was more interested in, in literature and actually that, that, that magazine uh, had a, a very important role in the United States. It was the first, uh, that's where uh, Ulysses by James Jones, uh, Joyce was published first and, uh, and it, was, it created a lot of controversy. Actually it created uh, uh, I think in, in the early 1920s, there was, uh, 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 they were, they were uh, sued by, by, uh, by, uh, by a conservative group uh, on the basis that they sort of uh, propagated pornography uh, with that Ulysses, uh, um, uh, uh, with publishing extracts from Ulysses. So, um, the magazine actually, so this is uh, Jane Heap uh, in, in one of those photos which was, uh, which was taken by um, uh, uh, Bernice Abbott, uh, uh, who was very much also in the circles. There were quite a few women who were very, very influential. Uh, Gertrude Stein was part of the group she, she published in that magazine, but there were other characters who, who are perhaps who are perhaps less known, but uh, but uh, but uh, very colorful and very interesting. One of them was uh, Baroness Elsa von Freytag Lauren Coven, uh, who was uh, one of the po pioneers of sound poetry, and also she was considered uh, uh, one of the earliest Dadaists. And uh, um, um, she also, uh, I mean, this is her. Uh, this is her photograph uh, um, in one of the costumes that she designed. And then she, she did, uh, this is a portrait of uh, Marcel Duchamp, which she uh, produced, which, uh, which when compared to, to the portrait of Duchamp by, um, by um, uh, Catherine Dreyer, actually, it's quite a uh, contrast, right? Uh, what, when I, um, when I, oh, I'm thinking about this transition, actually, again, this kind of the issue of skirting, you know, the, 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 the constructivist which becomes sort of skirted as, a, as, a, as an expression, actually, sort of takes almost on a literal kind of form with those women sort of uh, presenting it in a form that is <laughs> dressed, uh, you know. And when you look at this uh, portrait of Duchamp with the feathers and, you know, it's, it's kind of, it becomes like a dress in itself. So. Uh, the, uh, this is another of her works, which uh, I think it's quite um, quite interesting. Uh, one of her early sort of assemblages. Uh, um, okay, the okay. 
the other uh, another character who was very uh, very interesting in that group was uh, Juna Barnes, who was uh, a writer and an artist, and this is her portrait, uh, and also one of her illustrations from uh, from. Uh, what happened to the captions? I guess they are cut because of the screen. Uh, uh, she she wrote this book in which she she sort of used uh, short text and then produced these images. So this is one of her images from the from the book that she did in the 1920s. Uh, what's interesting about uh, the way how. Um, um, uh, how the transition from uh, literary to the visual arts is being um, uh, interpreted is that uh, uh, after the, the, the Ulysses trial, actually, which, which the publication lost, um, it, was, it, was, it has been uh, interpreted that the reason why um, uh, the publication switched towards the visual arts because it was because of the trauma created by the trial, which, which assumes, I guess, that visual images don't have the same kind of uh, uh, in, uh, engagement with with censorship as as uh, as, as written word has. Um, so, this, these are some photographs by. Uh, Abbott, which show you, um, uh, you know, this whole group as, uh, as uh, and, and how they ventured into the visual and verbal and so on. Um, I will be going a little bit quicker. So, uh, in the 1920s, so the Law Review publishes um, uh, articles on French Dadaism, on Brancusi, on Picabia, Leger, Gris, and also uh, on um, American modernists such as uh, Joseph Stella. It features also reproductions of works by Gabo, Pevsner, Zatkin, von Deisberg, Moholinage, and Zara, among others. It also reproduces the, the monument, Tatlin's monument to the Third International uh, in the winter issue, in 1922 winter issue of the, of the magazine, and Lisitsky's stage design in 1924. But uh, the way how, uh, I find it intriguing, the way how, uh, Constructivism is being framed within that publication is quite of interesting because um, the motive, the way how people interpret the appearance of the, the the photograph of the monument to the Third International, it's not that it was statement about constructivism. Actually, it was a way for a heap to uh, distance herself from uh, Anderson and sort of establish their, her own identity. So that issue of individualization of how constructivism actually becomes involved with uh, sort of something else than constructivism. The imagery, it's only a pretext to kind of more personal uh, uh, um, uh, confrontations or, or interactions. Also, what is very interesting, and that's where constructivism becomes, uh, uh, becomes more and more uh, privatized, so to speak, is that uh, uh, he, by 1923, she goes to Paris and she meets uh, Gordiev, and she becomes very much interested in his ideas, his spiritualism. So, uh, spiritualism uh, it takes over her interest in the visual arts, and ultimately, when constructive is being kind of rationalized, she publishes texts by um, such. Um, uh, writer says Gronowski, who uh, I, I had a very hard time to find out who he was. He was an artist in Paris, a Jewish artist, and he writes about constructivism and sort of uh, being uh, uh, not very, uh, very engaged with the reality of that time because, in a way, it doesn't uh, express enough uh, spirituality. So, in some way, she's preparing that ground to make uh, constructivism also very spiritual. But again, not uh, what's interesting, not, not Uspinski, who was a uh, major influence on, on Malevich and, and, uh, and uh, Mondrian, for example, but, uh, but Gordiev, who produces kind of a, almost like uh, the, 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 the branch of, 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 of that kind of uh, spiritualist uh, thought, so, uh, and also sort of splits from, from Uspinski. Um, Okay, so I will be moving 
quicker. Uh, the Machine Age exhibition uh, of 1927 is very important because, in a way, that's uh, that's Heap's uh, final statement about uh, about modern art, and it was organized by the Little Review by a, a group of uh, Societes des Urbanistes of Brussels, by the USSR Society of Cultural Relations and Foreign Countries, uh, by, uh, by a uh, sort of organization from Vienna, also by uh, press, and, uh, and Circus was mentioned as one of the organizers of that whole event. It take place in a, in a space uh, uh, in, a, in the Steinway Hall in 1927, which, uh, which was an industrial space, space which was eviscerated and kind of turned into a white box, which is also interesting that uh, you know, this aspect of machine age actually required uh, a, an empty space. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a catalog, and you see the cover and, and the announcement of the show. Uh, it was uh, it was a show that followed uh, a even more interesting show uh, of uh, of theater design, which also involved Russian and Polish uh, artists in 1926. So 1927, this show focuses on the interaction between uh, technology, science, and art, and it has. Uh, art objects, but it has a lot of um, uh, architectural design and so on. Uh, major European um, uh, writers and, and artists contribute to the publication. And for me, it's, it's, it's very important, this exhibition, because in a way, I think it's the first time when uh, the European avant-garde made a conscious decision to consider New York as, a, as an important kind of place for international conversation. So, what, what I, I'm trying to sort of establish as, as a story is that those immigrants who came and who created the Russian context and who sort of monopolized the, 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 the expression, the, 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 the display of Russian art in, in the United States, in New York in particular, are being pushed away by 1927 by uh, the, the European avant-garde who comes to the United States and, and decides that as much as Europe, Berlin, Paris, or London, whatever, that New York is one of those strategic places that, that they have to control. So this is where the, the emigre artists are being kind of on their own, kind of without this organizational structure, when as the international avant-garde kind of uh, creates its own narrative. And um, one of the... Uh, one of the artists who, uh, and architects who um, participate in, in that show and who contributed a major text uh, uh, to it uh, was, um, um, uh, his name? Uh, it's Hugh uh, Ferris who actually created this very fantasy kind of architecture and what, what makes it interesting that in his approach to architecture, actually mist and clouds and uh, become very important. So the architecture doesn't exist on its own. It's not kind of Malevich's, you know, uh, uh, more kind of holistic kind of uh, self-contained architecture, but it is, it has this kind of mystique and the mystique is kind of uh, visualized through clouds and, 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 and mist, which always kind of become part of his design, kind of futuristic or, or kind of utopian design. Um, in the exhibition, oh, I'm almost finished. So in the exhibition, there were works by, uh, uh, by Lozovic, who were some of his ornaments. There were works by Archipenko, there were also works by Stepanova and Popova, and uh, uh, some of the works actually which came for the theater exhibition were later brought to the exhibition, uh, the Machine Age exhibition. And I'm going to, to finish with this. So this is the Polish uh, section in that, uh, in that exhibition, in the Machine Age exhibition. By the 1930s, uh, when uh, people like Lozovic, uh, they moved towards socialist realism and uh, and uh, Societe Anonyme basically dissolves and organizes occasional exhibition but doesn't have the same kind of agenda that they had in the 1920s. That's when um, 
Museum of Modern Art comes to, to the picture and uh, Alfred Barr, who creates his own narrative about the development of uh, modern art, which kind of privileges the French uh, uh, branch rather than going to, to Russia or any other places. And I find it also interesting that uh, he, uh, Barr actually saw the Machine Age uh, exposition, right? And then he makes his ex uh, exhibition. And I, I, I don't know exactly what to do with it, but it's kind of interesting. He, he <coughs> drops age, so it's a Machine Age be, uh, exposition becomes Machine Art exhibition. So the, the difference between exposition and exhibition, it has its meaning. The fact that age is not there also, I think it stands for something. It means that age becomes sort of uh, like new age or something. It becomes maybe a symbol of uh, romanticism rather than, than, you know, the kind of agenda, formalist agenda that he has. But that's already a different stage when constructivism is, 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 is it becomes less and less clear and, and what happens uh, with that um, Ricky book that I mentioned at the very beginning where he sort of dissolves constructivism into this uh, very esoteric kind of uh, state uh, that the early stages uh, actually constructivism was very well defined and very very well uh, people were very well informed by the 1930s and 40s and 50s it becomes more and more fluid and it takes uh, I think the second stage of immigra immigrants, uh, the ones who came in the 1980s to produce a, a sort of, to reignite the narrative in a different way. So uh, uh, the way how I see it, th that lack of specificity actually fits into the idea of assimilation and migration and, and naturalization, which uh, all those artists in a way were, were involved with. I guess that's, all I have to say, and uh, uh, thank you. Dziękuję bardzo za to bardzo uh, obszerne przedstawienie uh, epoki przed przyjazdem Żarnower um, do Nowego Jorku i kontekstu artystów emigrantów. Proszę teraz o zabranie głosu Alice Mahon, która jest uh, wykładowcą historii sztuki na Uniwersytecie Cambridge. Jest autorką książek uh, takich jak uh, Surrealism and the Politics of Eros 1938-68, Thames and Hudson 2005, Eroticism and Art OUP 2007. Zajmuje się surrealizmem, sztuką performance, sztuką feministyczną, takimi artystkami jak Leonora mm, Carrington, Leonora mm, Fini. Ostatnio także pisała na temat Fridy Kahlo i mm, Matty. Jej referat dotyczy obecności Teresy Żarnowary w Nowym Jorku. But thank you for what I hope was a nice introduction. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes? This is okay now if this works. Okay, so we have technology. Um, I think my paper, in terms of um, the two preceding ones, um, will dovetail quite nicely because we're talking about um, the integration to a certain extent of the European avant-garde into the American avant-garde. Um, although I'm focused quite specifically on the case of um, Theresa Jarnover's uh, actual exhibition in the Peggy Guggenheim space. But given my leaning towards surrealism and um, women in general as in terms of um, art artists, um, that's also part of my, my frame. So we've had some mention already of the fact that uh, Theresa Jarnover had a first solo exhibition in Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century Gallery. It was on from April 23rd to May 11th, 1946, that year. In the Art of the Century Gallery, which was situated at 30 West 57th Street in Manhattan. It was a relatively modest exhibition of 16 small gouaches, um, which were priced between $30 and $200. Um, obviously, as gouaches, they were going to be less expensive. However, when we um, compare those prices to those of male artists and even more established female artists, they're still quite modest. That said, a work by Jackson Pollock and, as a painting would sell for about $600, $800 at the time. 
Um, but as I say, they were modest in scale, modest in number, and modest relatively in price. Uh, the titles of the works were poetic, mythological, or religious, um, including The Serpent, Cataclysm, Interpenetration of Forms, Maelstrom, Europa, Entombment, and The Prophet. Uh, the style of the works were expressionist and surrealist. They were totemic, abstracted figures, often drawn in black ink with the cloisonné effect, and interpenetrating limbs um, and lines that suggested an aspect of automatic technique. Eyes, breasts, flowing hair, and voluptuous limbs, or angular faces with more armoured limbs, gendered rather primitive forms, and invariably female and male forms were often staged alongside each other. Uh, Jarnover's use of space was especially sculptural, um, but also surreal, I would suggest. It suggested a state of mind um, with often encircling figures uh, and also vocative, which I think, again, is important to keep in mind given the, the emphatic titles she gives these often abstract works. The Art of This Century Gallery, designed by Romanian Jewish immigrant Freda Kiesler, opened in October 1942. So by 1946, it was already quite well known as a center for creative exchange between American and emigre artists. Genre's gouaches were exhibited in the gallery's temporary exhibition space, the exhibition space known as the Daylight Gallery. And here you have an image of um, Art of the Century, the gallery, uh, an original, if you like, from uh, 1946. On the right, if you Google map it today, it's the same building. And there we have Friedrich Kiesler uh, down the bottom. Um, but her, exhibi her exhibition was, again, as you can see, if you look at this map, um, it was down in the Daylight Gallery where you had the large uh, windows overlooking the street. So in many ways, it's quite a difficult space for an artist. Invariably, as in this room, we actually end up curtaining off the Daylight Gallery. But in contrast to the rest of the gallery, it was also the most simplistic um, space. It had none of Friedrich Kiesler's special effects, if you like, as we'll see in a moment. Um, between 1942 and the gallery's closing in the summer of 1947, because again, this gallery space was a short-lived but um, fantastically important um, space for avant-garde art, but it did close in the summer of 1947. However, within those five years of its history, 150 artists showed here in 55 temporary exhibitions. And so invariably you find when you're researching actually the temporary shows, they last for two weeks, three weeks, there's a quick turnover of artists. Um, and I think that, also, that gives you a sense of dynamism, but also it's important in terms of the market and the reception of a lot of these exhibitions and new artists, because there was a very short amount of time for them to be discovered, for reviews to be written, and for works to be purchased. And essentially for Peggy Guggenheim, I think, in terms of the space, what she was concerned to do was to give an expose to artists who she was going to represent. And this was her selling space. So this was her place where actually you would go and see a show, but also where there were works on file. Um, so that it was very much a place to lure people to buy the art. The rest of the space was, of course, Peggy. It was Peggy Guggenheim's collection. So uh, it was supported by a permanent collection. But as I say, this was a sales room, effectively, in the Daylight Gallery. To have a solo show in the Daylight Gallery space was a major feat for any artist, as it always attracted the attention of both collectors and critics. The gallery was a unique space for championing um, both established European surrealists and nascent American abstract expressionists. And it played a hugely important role in promoting women artists in both fields. Of those who showed at her gallery, almost 40% were women, which again was obviously and to this day, very unusual and unique. They included Virginia Admiral, Zena Cage, Lenora Carrington, Frida Kahlo, Alice Raon Palin, um, Irene Rice Pereira, Kay Sage, Hedda Stern, Sophie Arp, Alice Trumbull Mason, Isabel Wahlberg, and Peggy's own daughter, Peggy Vale. In this paper, I want to reflect on this historical moment of exile and cross fertilization of the avant garde and to what extent an exhibition of a Polish-Jewish woman artist in Peggy Guggenheim's Art of This Century Gallery in the year 1946 sheds light on that moment. Whilst it's impossible to fit Zarnover neatly into any one avant-garde narrative, we must not forget that this is often the unifying characteristic of all avant-garde artists, a nomadism which is geographical, stylistic, and ideological. In other words, the very 
strength of their art and careers is often the fact that it's impossible to pin them down. And there's an evolution and exchange of ideas and styles in their work. Um, and this offers a better model than that of centre and periphery, which, all, which can all too easily collapse these other important characteristics and considerations, notably geography, style and ideology, which tends to get thrown out um, with the baby. Creative exchange and internationalism were inherent to avant-garde circles and their ideological positions, whether they were in Paris, Warsaw, Prague, Mexico City or New York. In April 1946, the New York Times chief critic, Art uh, Edward Alden Jewell, reviewed Jarnover's show and was impressed by what he saw. And it's important to state he wasn't always impressed by what he saw. He spoke his mind. He declared her gouaches demonstrated, in his words, intelligently directed emotion. This interpretation may have been influenced by the words of the painter Barnett Newman, who wrote a preface, as we know, for Jarnover's exhibition catalogue. Newman was a friend of Jarnover's since 1945, an admirer of her art, and he shared an East European heritage. His parents were Jewish immigrants from Poland and arrived in New York in 1900. Five years later, Barnett himself was born. Printed on a feminine pink catalogue cover, Newman's supporting text in blue referred to the strength and dignity of Jarnover's art. So again, this emphasis on a strength, a silent strength. More importantly, he aligned these qualities with contemporary American painters in claiming she, like them, believed that art must say something, hence the title of my paper. Newman described Jarnover as quote, the leader of the constructivist movement in Poland, the leader of the constructivist movement in Poland, who was well known throughout the capitals of Europe. Newman would have known of her powerful photomontages for the Polish emigre publication we discussed at length yesterday, The Defense of Warsaw of 1942, but in his catalogue text, he alludes to her formative role in the Polish avant-garde of earlier decades, notably beginning in 1923, when she took part in the exhibition of new art in Vilna, and when she had a leading role alongside uh, Stuka in launching the avant-garde group and journal Block the following year. Her influential experimentation continued in her powerful photo montage cover for the bibliophile edition of Stern's Europa, published in Warsaw in 1929. And for the photo montage cover of Europa, she brought surrealism, functionalism, and abstraction together in bizarre juxtaposition, color planes, and abstracted letters, respectively. Jarnov returned to art as a means of shaping reality rather than ornamenting it, in keeping again with the social utopian dimension of her circle and her art throughout her career. Newman went further in his praise, however. Not only was she the leader of uh, constructivism, um, he wrote that she was perhaps the last important European artist to arrive here in New York during the war. These are his words. He stated, it is America's pride that having enjoyed its hospitality, she has joined the small but distinguished company of European artists who have chosen to make America their permanent home. Now certainly Jarnover had chosen to make America her home, albeit via Europe, Paris, Spain, Portugal, which he doesn't mention, and albeit four years after her departure from Poland in 1937 with her first attempt to enter New York, she had been denied access. And of course her exile was forced by world political events. Further, whilst the exhibition was significant for her career, coming three years after her settling in New York, in many ways it was a little bit late for that same career and for the avant-garde moment in New York. Um, it was perhaps therefore a show that was as poignant as it was celebratory. By 1946, following the liberation of Paris, many members of the European avant-garde were already beginning their exodus, and surrealism in particular seemed to be retreating from American shores. That year, André Breton returned to Paris. Julien Lévy closed his New York gallery after 14 years promoting surrealism uh, and often works of art deemed to be surrealist fantastic to American audiences. And Charles Henry Ford's uh, announced the end of his uh, avant-garde journal, which had promoted European avant-gardism, notably surrealism, view. Peggy Guggenheim herself left New York in 1946. In that summer, only a month after the show, returning to the city of Paris, which she had last seen under Nazi occupation. Her memoirs make clear that her allegiances were with Europe, not with her home city of New York, nor with those American artists, notably Jackson Pollock, whose careers she had helped foster uh, in art of this century. 
Oh, sorry, that's the quote. Pollock's debut show at our gallery from the 9th to 27th November 1943, which included The Moon Woman of 1942-3, and was purchased by Alfred Barr, whose name came up again yesterday, uh, the founding director of MoMA uh, in New York. He had bought Jackson Pollock's uh, Moon Woman now in their collection for $600. Uh, and again, of course, Peggy Guggenheim's role in this liaison and in launching Pollock was all important. But in her memoirs, she's very clear, as I say, that Paris and the European artists are really her love, her passion. Her travel to Paris and then, of course, to Venice leads to a whole new chapter in her, her life as an art collector and patron. However, finding Paris too changed, she would choose to move her life and favoured artworks to Venice and reinvent herself there. Jarnova's show thus marked the end of wartime angst and exile for one generation of artists and at the same time the birth of a younger generation. In many ways, she stands between these shifts. Uh, and it's reflected in Newman's text on Jarnover, I suggest. He describes her in prophetic terms, aligning her with contemporary art, however also suggesting, as he lauds her, that there's a generational and geographic shift. Or at least I think that's what you can read between the lines. He writes, it is only fitting that the prophet uh, Jarnover should find her home where her prophecy has been so well fulfilled, in other words, by others. He explains that she recognized that purism and abstraction cut off from reality was not enough. And significantly, he then states, and I put it in front of you, in this she is close to many American painters who have been no less sensitive to the tragedy of their times. It is this transition from abstract language to abstract thought. It is this concern with abstract subject matter rather than abstract disciplines that gives her work its strength and its dignity, the two key words. The truth here is mutually inclusive, for the defense of human dignity is the ultimate subject matter of art, and it is only in its defense that any of us will ever find strength. So it's a clever way, as I say, of both celebrating her and including her in a picture of abstract art, and in terms of his ideas on that uh, style, and also American painters um, at that, in that decade, in that moment. As Serge Guibault noted in How New York Stole Modern Art, Newman here attacked abstract art of the purest kind as a kind of totalitarianism, an attack which is very much the product of the historical moment. In March 1946, the month prior to this show, Winston Churchill had delivered his famous Iron Curtain speech, officially titled Sinners of, of Peace, as we know, warning of Russia's power and influence over East Europe and asking the United States to make a fraternal association with Britain on the western side of the Iron Curtain. Um, Guibo notes that Newman would have had this speech in mind as he penned the catalogue essay, and that in this situation the work of the Polish artist took on a new significance, which Barnett Newman recognised. To my mind, Newman's words might be read as a portrait of an artist in exile, at a moment of aesthetic and ideological crisis, or at least change. Equally, his understanding of abstraction gives us a portrait of the emerging generation of avant-garde artists in America in 1946. Peggy Guggenheim had several advisors, of course, including Marcel Duchamp, but the important thing to remember is her role in bringing artists' ideas and collections together, this idea that she brought them together. Of course, she exemplified the new woman of her day in her career and lifestyle, uh, and in bringing European influences and the experience of her first gallery attempt, the Guggenheim Jeune Gallery, which she'd launched in London in 1938, on board as she fashioned a New York um, collection in Art of the Century, must be always, if you like, framed in these international, very avant-gardist terms, as a new woman who had travelled, who had collected, obviously thanks to her, uh, her inheritance, but also as someone who stayed true to a very particular type of art that she favoured and that was fabulously unpopular when she did so. Indeed, when she opened a New York gallery, Guggenheim wore a pair of earrings, famously, that were intended to show her impartiality between surrealist and abstract art. And this she says in her Confessions of an Art Addict, that she wasn't going to get almost embroiled in this debacle between surrealist and abstract, European and American, and this idea that they were at each other's throats, which of course is, is a myth. Um, but of course, the earrings in themselves very much emphasize, as I say, this liaison that she was encouraging and seeing and witnessing. One earring was designed by the French painter Yves Tanguy, the other earring by the American sculptor Alexander Calder. So again, she fashioned herself literally 
as an embodiment of this um, cross-cultural exchange. Her self-fashioning and her dramatic persona are often the focus of writings on Guggenheim. But another aspect of her life and leanings, her Jewishness, was equally important and doesn't get, again, quite enough attention, I suggest. Her, ju her Judaism was not orthodox, but it certainly led her to support those whose artistic, religious, and political beliefs put their lives under threat. She opened art of this century with a benefit for the American Red Cross, and in commissioning Kiesler to design it, she chose an architect who was himself a Romanian Jewish immigrant, whose famous later achievements included the Shrine of the Book, housing the Dead Sea Scrolls at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. The purpose of Guggenheim's gallery, in her own words, was, quote, to create a center where artists will be welcome and where they can feel that they are cooperating in establishing a research center for new ideas. This undertaking will serve its purpose, she said, only if it succeeds in serving the future instead of recording the past. So again, it wasn't to be a mausoleum to history. It wasn't a traditional museum in that sense. She said it was about serving the future. This was the, the press release. The gallery, as we've seen, was on the seventh floor of a building that in many ways is rather modest. It had been a grocery store. It had a grocery store at street level. And it was rather high up, so it wasn't in any way uh, compared to her relatives, it wasn't a very majestic space. But the interior of the gallery was an homage to avant-garde art and ideas, and the idea specifically that art and life are inseparable. On its curved painting, on its curved walls, paintings hung at odd angles, and a lighting scheme was set up to alternately lit aspect, light up aspects of the room, so that it pulsed like your blood, in Frieda Kiesler's words. So again, this idea that you were literally engaged, surrounded, confronted, by art was all important to the aesthetic of the space, according to the designer, the woman who was funding it, and of course that stage is a very different space for the appreciation of the works we're looking at. Um, it forces the viewer into a whole different viewing mentality. In the first abstract gallery, paintings were suspended in such a way that the spectator meandered through floating art and freestanding sculpture. As Kieser did away with walls in defiance of the modernist cube gallery, supposedly the neutral gallery space, the white cube, but as we know, one which in many ways um, denies the outside world by, very fact the, by the very fact that there's no windows onto the world. In the kinetic gallery, so you have the abstract gallery and then you have the kinetic gallery, members of the public were encouraged to interact with the art, to touch the art. Notably, thanks to a large wheel of Pater Noster, that the public rotated to view images through a people. So again, performativity was part of this radical space. In the Surrealist Gallery, which you see there with the Giacometti, woman with a throat cut on the right-hand side, um, in this gallery, the walls and ceiling were painted black. Again, not exactly what you'd expect, very theatrical. And the painter Charles Seliger remembers them as tunnel-like darkened except for individual lighting on the paintings, which created a mysterious dreamlike atmosphere. The artist John Cage described art of the century as a kind of funhouse. You couldn't just walk through it, you had to become part of it. In sum, the gallery reflected Peggy Guggenheim's position on the crossroads between a European past and an American future, um, as Philip Rylands has observed. But in my view, I don't think, again, it should be seen in terms of this geographical polarity. It wasn't about a European past and an American future. It was about a past which again divided and a future which could bring together. Kiesler's architectural, architectural design was undoubtedly a fusion of influences and friendships, from the geometries of the De Stille movement to his friendships with the younger American artists such as Robert Motherwell, Charles Seliger and Arshul Gorky. And here you have another shot of the Daylight Gallery, um, where, of course, you can see um, a Magritte, a Miro, the windows, but also this idea that you could uh, look through a library of images. Again, very much trying to go against the traditional idea of both a gallery and a museum as a space. In 1956, the critic Rudy Blech acknowledged the importance and influence of the gallery, art of the century, in his uh, book, 1956 book, Modern Art, USA, Men, Rebellion, Conquest. Here Blesch writes, here trooped in to Art of the Century Gallery, with canvases under their arms, a dozen wild youths who had found the doors of the museums closed, again emphasising that no one else was interested, if you like. Of course, Blesch presented a unified and all heroic image of American art in this book and in this quote, and most notably emphasised to readers that this was a group of young 
men. At the frontier of modernism, their canvases, their weapons. The young male artists who exhibited in the Daylight Gallery included Robert De Niro, David Hare, Jackson Pollock, who I've mentioned, Charles Seliger, Clifford Still. But he went further in his image of these troops, writing, they're built like athletes, and some of them, like Pollock and de Kooning, who you see in this lineup, paint like athletes. If pictures could explode, theirs would. It's, it's a hoot to read it now, but this language again. If pictures could explode, theirs would. So grimly, by the force of their wills, have they compressed their dual muscularity onto the canvases. So you have a group, an image of young men coming in. As I say, their art is their weapon, very much, again, speaking in military language in that sense. But, of course, Blesch's words remind us of the gendered language, framing and promotion of this nascent avant-garde group, the American Abstract Expressionists, and in the process, the all too frequent at the time and to this day, exclusion of women from that heroic narrative. However, as I said, women did play a leading role in Art of the Century Gallery. They were included in its vision. They were seminal to it. And through Guggenheim, women collectors and women critics lent their support to women artists. 30 women collectors bought from the gallery and it was championed by Maud Riley, a prominent critic for Art Digest magazine. In 1943 and 1945, Peggy Guggenheim also held two major shows of women artists. Exhibition by 31 women um, from January to February 1943. My thing is frozen. And the women from June to July 1945. Before the gallery closed, she'd organized a dozen uh, solo shows for women artists too. Jarnova was part of that vital moment in the recognition of women's art. There's little documentation of these shows, unfortunately. Even in 1997, there was a show entitled Art of this Century, The Women, um, at the Pollock, uh, at the Pollock Resner House on Long Island, which attempted to actually recreate the 1943 and 1945 group women shows. But they, too, had a problem in actually finding most of the works that were shown. And notoriously, we know that um, Peggy Guggenheim kept very little records of her exhibitions, unfortunately, for those of us researching it. And due to time limitations, I can't rehearse all the women artists, of course, that exhibited. But I will give you a quick survey of the group and solo shows involving women with a view specifically to keeping in mind how Jarnover, within this broader gender framework and her show should be always appreciated. The press release for the exhibition by 31 women of 1943 declared, here then is testimony to the fact that the creative ability of women is by no means restricted to the decorative vein as could be deduced from the history of art by women through the ages. The spirit of the young wife in ancient Greece who traced on the oilskin window the silhouette of her departing warrior husband is in these women. So this is the 43 show. I don't actually have a slide of the cover. The language is curious for this, um, this catalogue. The women are deemed to be able, and yet the warrior husband is still mentioned, as you'd expect in 1943. The women who exhibited were selected by a jury consisting of Peggy Guggenheim and seven men. André Breton, Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst, Jimmy Ernst, Howard Putzel, James Trollsoby and James Sweeney. So again, it's quite a, it's a nice dinner party. Guggenheim also asked for recommendations from Alfred Barr, which again are important if we think about whether his lack of support for Jarnover. He was very happy to promote women, he was buying women, art, and he was known as someone who could recommend abstract artists to her. The women chosen were in the majority young, under the age of 30, and 16 nationalities were represented. Only one woman selected declined the invitation, Georgia O'Keeffe. She came to the gallery according to the memoirs of Jimmy Ernst, a not so still life, his memories, his memoir, and he writes that she arrived and stonily faced an odd Peggy down with, I am not a woman painter. Amongst the works exhibited were paintings by women who changed the face of surrealism, including Birthday by Dorothy Tanning, which you see here, Shepherdess of the Sphinxes by Leonor Fini in the middle, um, and uh, Self-Portrait Drawing in Pencil by Frida Kahlo, which you see here on the right. And again, this is very indicative of the women artists. I mean, I happen to have worked on these in particular, but it's indicative of that the fact there was a great excitement about these women artists. They did get reviews, very celebratory reviews, which were surprised that they were women often. Um, but they were then quickly dumped. They were dumped until the 1980s and 1990s, and to this, this 
decade, when again we're having women shows and a reclamation of, of such artists. But at the time there was great excitement about them, wild ranging. Um, and as I say, um, they were important in actually presenting a face of surrealism in particular when it came to these women, people who were deemed, artists deemed to be surrealist. Now whether the artists themselves liked the label is a whole other uh, paper, but they were being celebrated and presented and sold as exciting young surrealists. Others who were exhibited in this particular show, which was fabulous, as 31 women coming together, included Irene Rice Pereira, Maria Elena Vieira da Silva, Alice Trumbull Mason, Hedda Stern, again one of the few women who got a lot of attention at the time, Fanny Hillsmith, Sophie Arp, and Gypsy Rose Lee. Gypsy Rose Lee was starring at the time in Michael Todd's cabaret, Star and Garter, but she contributed a collage box to the show. In some, it was a formidable group of international artists, a fabulous collection of works, um, and largely works which demonstrated surrealist and abstract styles. The show of women led the New York Sun critic, Henry McBride, however, to sarcastically write, surrealism is about 70% hysterics, 20% literature, 5% good painting, and 5% is just saying boo to the innocent public. Considering the statistics the doctors hand out and considering the percentages above, it's obvious that women ought to excel at surrealism. The Time Art magazine critic James Stern refused to review the show when invited to do so by one of its painters, Buffy Johnson, saying women should stick to having babies. So again, this is the resistance and the battle of the time that I think again allows us to reframe uh, Jarnova's show. The second show of women artists was simply called The Women and was held um, from June to July 1945, and it involved 30 women. Their works were again largely surrealist and abstractionist. Almost half of the artists exhibiting had been in the 1943 show, so it showed loyalty, continuity in terms of those women. And new artists to join it include uh, Lee Krasner, Louise Bourgeois, Kay Sage, again, who is now part of the surrealist group. According to review in Art News for this show of 1945, the women who Peggy Guggenheim has picked for her string have definitely something on the ball. The most surprising trait here is an almost masculine vigour of ideas. The works as a whole balance satisfactorily in the Art of the Century galleries, promoting a new conception of the weaker sex. Other all-female organisations should have a look in at the show, which is so refreshingly unladylike. So in terms of the shift of language from critics from 1943 to 45, there is an evolution, we might say, amongst them. There is a progress. However, women are deemed to be successful because there's an almost masculinity about their art. Why is it all deemed very masculine now and not ladylike? Largely due to the shift towards the abstract, perhaps, and away from the figurative. Um, uh, towards the informe and away from the self-portrait, which again seem to, if you like, complement more what men were doing at the time. Also impressed with this show were uh, Edward Alden Jewell, the chief art critic from the New York Times, who I cited at the outset, who reviewed John of show. Uh, he wrote, there is nothing save the catalogue to indicate that these artists are women. The work might just have well been produced by the men. An interesting comment, I think, again, this idea that they're as good as, and that the show could have been called the men, the ultimate uh, flattery, if you like. Um, but again, it shows an openness, let's say, on his part. These are undoubtedly controversial exhibitions. These will be controversial exhibitions, I would say, if they're on show now, again, about how we group women, how we put them side by side, and the titles we give the show, etc., etc. But what's important is they force sexual politics onto the appreciation, reception, and collection of the avant-garde at this time. As male artists of the abstract expressionist circle were being celebrated in emphatically masculinist terms, women artists, and particularly group shows, were challenging that gender discourse. Other solo shows for women artists and art of the century between 42 and 47 included a solo exhibition of work um, by the uh, Boston-born abstract expressionist Irene Rice Pereira, who was in this uh, 45 show and then gets a solo show. Um, one of the works that were exhibited was from 1942, her composition in white. So again, there was a wartime works being exhibited and celebrated. Um, a solo show was given to the Swiss sculptor Isabel Wahlberg, 
course, partner for Patrick Wahlberg. And interestingly, she had a show of constructions, but because she was only um, 30 at the time, she felt she couldn't possibly take over two rooms of the Daylight Gallery and chose to exhibit alongside Rudolf Ray. So again, the trepidation of a female having an inaugural show at this space is, is important. Um, and another person whose show was very um, successful was the Ukrainian-born emigre Janet Sobel, who you see here, um, whose exhibited work included this, the attraction of pink. Um, and again, Sobel is curious because she wasn't under 30. She was 52 when she had her solo show. So she's an older woman. The press made a big point about the fact she was a grandmother having a show um, when she was discovered, if you like, at this time. Her son, the artist Sol Sobert, had written to Max Ernst and asked if he would like to view his mother's uh, paintings. And again, to give Max Ernst his due, he went uh, to her house and saw them and introduced her to Peggy Guggenheim. And this is how this sort of friendship meeting exchange is how the art market worked. Uh, her works are priced from $30, comparable to, again, um, Jarnover, but up to 700, twice the price, largely because they were oil paintings. And Peggy bought two of them, The Frightened Bride and My Son Stanley, uh, which is important. The art was described by Sidney Janus as filled with unconscious surrealist fantasy. And more, you've probably heard, Jackson Pollock admitted to Clement Greenberg that the works impressed him when he viewed the show with Clement Greenberg. So when they went to see the show, Pollock admitted to Greenberg that he liked this woman's art, Janet Sobel. Uh, and this praise by Pollock, of course, isn't surprising, given her dripping technique, a self-invented method for applying paint, which Janus himself, uh, Sidney Janus himself, refers to in the catalogue essay. Um, Edward Adam Jewell admired her art's primitivism, his or, his or her abstraction. So again, at the time, the critics loved it. Um, her art was purchased. And only now, again, everyone is saying, hang on, Jackson Pollock wasn't the the first and only person to be using drip technique, but still, poor Janet Sobel, a moment of, of fame, and she's been lost very much by the, the modern canon. So we come back to our, our protagonist, Teresa Jarnover, and her solo exhibition. So it opens three months after Janet Sobel's show. Uh, so that's, if you like, what she's up against, but worse still, three days after a show by Jackson Pollock. It's his third solo show in the Daylight Gallery from the 2nd to the 20th of April. And to follow Jackson Pollock must have been quite daunting. I've, I've missed one slide, I'm afraid, uh, of his show. But he is now a celebrated abstract expressionist, the term having been fully coined, if you like, exhibited 19 works, um, 11 of which sold, with prices ranging from $100 to $850, including Moon Vessel, 1945. But again, whatever about the actual success of the show, this was when Clement Greenberg famously uh, wrote and lauded Jackson Pollock in a review saying Pollock's superiority to his contemporaries um, uh, in this country lies in his ability to create a genuinely violent and extravagant art without losing stylistic control. His emotion starts out pictorially. It does not have to be castrated in order to be in the picture. Edward Allen Jewell, whilst writing that the show, this is our critic we like, because he likes uh, Jarnover, said the show baffled him. He found it exasperating, but he encouraged people to have a look for themselves. Uh, however, again, Clement Greenberg's language is fabulously masculine, uh, and he says he is the best. So, as you can imagine, if you are someone who's been desperate to have a show, desperate to have a review for your career and political reasons, desperate to get funding, and then Pollock show ends, and you have your show in the Daylight Gallery. It's, 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 a, it's a frame that, again, we have to be sensitive to. So her show really received much less attention, unsurprisingly, when it opened on the 23rd of April. It ran until the 11th May, 1946. That was for 18 days, the exact same as Jackson Pollock's, pretty much. But she exhibited, again, in only one room of the temporary gallery space. Um, and she exhibited alongside a young man uh, by the name of Robert De Niro. And now we say Robert De Niro uh, Sr. to distinguish him from the more handsome Robert De Niro Jr. Um, but again, this is important, and she wasn't meant to. This Actually, she wasn't scheduled to have the show in April. It was meant to be in the summer, so we're not sure what happened. Um, but she shares a space, just like Isabel Wahlberg did, with another young male American artist. 
So Robert De Niro had studied at the Experimental Art and Design School, the Black, College, uh, Black Mountain College in North Carolina under Joseph Albers, and then with Hans Hoffman at his uh, Massachusetts Summer School, and at Hilda Rebe's Museum of Non-Objective Art. So his pedigree was good. Unfortunately, most of his work from that period and from this exhibition were lost in a studio of fire of 1949. But for my purposes, it's Greenberg's review of it that's important and important for our, our conference. Um, while for Greenberg, De Niro was no Jackson Pollock, and we've seen that he's already said Jackson Pollock was the be-all and end-all in that sense, he praised De Niro's savagely brilliant colour. He praised bombast in his colour, so savagery, bombast. He talked about four of his influences, and he described him as an important young discovery who had, despite his youth, achieved what he described as monumental effects rare in abstract art. Greenberg's emphasis on Pollock's violent and extravagant art, and now on this younger De Niro's bombast and monumental art again, uh, in two reviews in April, May, surrounding uh, Teresa's uh, exhibition, again, allow us to appreciate where she stood, but also the tenor of Barnett Newman's text and where he was coming from in his defense of what she was doing. Her art had none of this unleashed drama. Her art was to be appreciated for Newman, he encourages the audience in terms of strength and dignity, not this assault, this sort of weaponry approach, if you like. Through the lens of the art of this century, consciously crafted as a creative center by Guggenheim and Kiesler and supported by a dynamic network of artists, critics, collectors, and advisors, we can better appreciate the last decade, I suggest, of Jean Over's life and the status that we must credit her with having from having this solo show at the Daylight Gallery. Guggenheim's matronage of artists during uh, working in surrealism and abstraction, notably her support of young women artists and emerging women artists, was a vital part of the story of modern art between Paris and New York, Europe and North America. John of a show of gouaches at art... Oh, there's my missing slide. That's Pollock and uh, Moon Woman. But we won't let him have the last word. So her show of gouaches at Art of the Century was not a commercial success, but few were. So Pollock was rare, obviously. Um, Pereira sold very many too, but most shows did not sell. Um, what is more telling is how the ten oil paintings by her co-exhibitioner, Robert De Niro, won the attention of the press as oil paintings, how they were hailed as forceful, bombastic, monumental, and how this reflected a shift in art and its appreciation. For Art News, in its review of Jean of her show, um, the critic wrote that she was returning from, an, um, from a pure non-objective art to representational forms. So she was moving from pure non-abstraction, uh, from pure abstraction to representational forms. And this was praised. For the New York Times, her art, as we saw, exhibited an intelligently directed emotion. And then she's described by Newman as an artist who has learned again that purest abstraction was not enough an art must speak something to the historical moment, an artist who is prophetic in foretelling what was to come. So again, I think within her reception at the time, she's very much seen as the end of an era, as someone who's worked through moments in abstraction, but perhaps has arrived, as I say, at this crunch moment almost for abstraction on American shores. One might suggest, or I suggest, that Newman stages a genre of her as an artist who deserved acclaim, but almost as a female guide for younger, brasher, male American artists who are in the midst of deciding where abstraction and where avant-gardism might go. Age, gender, and nationality divided these two artists, and at a time, in terms of uh, De Niro and, um, and genre of her, but at a time when the world was emerging from the ashes of World War, and a Cold War was beginning. Youth, virility, and the national seemed to win the day as far as Clement Greenberg was concerned. However, in exhibiting alongside a very important generation of international women artists at Guggenheim's gallery, Jeanneva contributed to the cultural dialogue and the painterly debates between avant-garde artists from Europe and the United States, helping to challenge simple notions of center and periphery, um, and to explore memory, history, and future in her art. However, it was in this last decade of Joan life, of course, that the shift between an art that must say something, to return us to the title, and an art that was going to be about art, an art for art's sake, would begin, and the tensions between Paris and New York over the abstract brushstroke would mount. 
uh, her exhibition marks this turning point, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a perfect uh, coda to this session. We are well, well into lunch break, obviously, as you all know, but we cannot resist to dis discuss this paper. So if you please yes, sit by the table and... Um, Ja chciałem zadać pytanie Markowi Bartelikowi. A, chodzi mi o moment, na którym skończyłeś swoją wypowiedź, czyli o Alfreda Bara i o tę wystawę. Bo tutaj wspominałeś o tym, w jaki sposób rosyjski konstruktywizm był wchodził do Stanów Zjednoczonych, do Nowego Jorku. 27 rok, czyli ten rok, kiedy Bart zrobił wystawę Mechanic Art. To jest rok, w którym on przez kilka miesięcy przebywał w Związku Radzieckim. Moje pytanie jest takie, czy były jakieś reperkusje w kontekście tego, o czym mówiłeś tej wizyty? Czy były reperkusje... No, czy to w, jak, w sensie takim, no bo mówiłeś wcześniej o tym, w jaki sposób sztuka rosyjskiego konstruktywizmu była wprowadzana do Nowego Jorku. Czy w tym kontekście wizyta Alfreda Bara w Związku Radzieckim miała jakieś znaczenie? Znaczy, to jest interesujące. Ja, ja w ogóle muszę <śmiech> przeprosić, dlatego że ja się o trzeciej obudziłem i, i jak już dobrałem tutaj, to ledwo, ledwo wygłosiłem ten referat. Ja może przepraszam, że to było nudne, znaczy w sensie takim, że ja nie mogłem tego jak gdyby podźwignąć energetycznie. Natomiast to tak, ja tylko dygresja. Natomiast wracając do Bara i do jego wizyty w, w tym, w Rosji, co jest ciekawe, że on się najbardziej zainteresował muzyką rosyjską, że on w zasadzie sztuki awangardy specjalnie i teatrem. Natomiast, natomiast sztuki wizualne on traktował dosyć no, znaczy to nie było dla niego najważniejsze. W momencie, kiedy wrócił, właśnie ta wizyta go w pewnym sensie utwierdziła w tym, żeby skonstruować ten model swój kolekcji MOMY, prawda, który wykluczył w pewnym sensie awangardę rosyjską. Czyli z jednej strony on, on, on się tą kulturą, w tą kulturę włączył, ale z drugiej strony jak gdyby włączył się z innego miejsca, tak jak mówię, muzyka i, i teatr go zainteresowały, natomiast te sztuki wizualne, znaczy ta cała awangarda nie weszła w tą jego narrację, którą on potem rozwinął i to zajęło dosyć dużo czasu, zanim to zostało potem rozszerzone i, i, i ten konstruktywizm czy, czy, czy suprematyzm wszedł. Um, także, także ta wizyta miała dla niego ważne znaczenie, ale, ale jak gdyby znaczenie, które polegało na tym, że go utwierdziło w to, że, że raczej ta, ten nurt awangardy nie jest ważny do, do tego konstruktu, który on stworzył w sensie tej narracji modernistycznej. Prawda? Um. Dobrze, ad vocem do, do tej, tej wymiany. Alfred Barr właściwie jakby jak spotkał się z tymi rosyjskimi awangardowymi artystami, to był zdziwiony, że nie można od nich dostać obrazów albo rzeźb, bo to go interesowało. To były ewentualnie dzieła, które on by chciał nabyć do, do mamy, prawda? I jakby problem polegał na tym, że on nie, nie zrozumiał, czy też nie chciał zrozumieć jakby tego politycznego zaangażowania, tak? Związków sztuki z politycznym zaangażowaniem artystów. To zresztą no, oczywiście nie byłoby też mile widziane w Ameryce i w tym czasie, a zwłaszcza w okresie późniejszym, wiadomo. A myślę, że jakby to też jakby naprowadza na taki trop, który, który też jakby widać w przypadku Żarnowe Równy i wielu innych artystów, emigrantów, tak? artystów tworzących na wygnaniu, tych, którzy wcześniej byli jakby częścią jakichś ruchów awangardowych, mniej czy bardziej upolitycznionych, że będąc na wygnaniu nie sposób toczyć dalej tej walki. Tak? Raz, że jest się osamotnionym często, a po drugie jest to zupełnie inne otoczenie, gdzie jakby wcześniejsze cele, idee właściwie rozmijają się z otaczającą rzeczywistością. Także jakby no tylko taka, taka, taki Czy, komentarz, uwaga. Ja bym tylko powiedział, żeby już skończyć jakby ten temat, że to, to co chyba 
w pewnym sensie nas różni, że, że ja, ja doszukuję się tutaj jakiegoś takiego załamania prawda, rzeczywistości, że w momencie, kiedy następuje ten przełom emigracyjny, że, że coś, coś się zamyka. Prawda? Natomiast e, twój wykład prawda, w pewnym sensie mówi, że jest to, że, że tam ten, ten, to, to połączenie cały czas istnieje. Ja myślę, że może jest tro, to, trochę z, z awangardą rosyjską właśnie było troszeczkę inaczej z tego względu, że, że ona była upolityczniona od samego początku prawda, i że było to odpolitycznianie jej w różnych kierunkach, co ja mówiłem, albo w stronę komercjalizacji, która tak to, naprawdę się nie powiodła między innymi z tego powodu, że tych dzieł było niedużo, prawda, więc taki suplementem były te, te, te prace takie teatralne, jakieś pseudofiguratywne i tak dalej. Z drugiej strony, czyli, czyli to, to, to było to, z drugiej strony, że jednak naparcie było na to, że pomimo, że, że Ameryka jest tym melting pot, prawda, że jednak, żeby być w tym melting pot, to trzeba być podobnym, prawda, że, że z jednej strony się trzeba wychylić, ale z drugiej strony nie można się za dużo wychylić, bo jest, jest ta siła wyrównująca i że każdy emigrant w pewnym sensie się zderza z tym. Ja myślę, że Arnowra się też zderzyła z tym dosyć, dosyć mocno, ale tak jak podobnie jak ci Rosjanie, o których mówiłem, że, że to powoduje, że, że, że jest poszukiwanie w, w jakichś innych związków. Natomiast to, co mi się wydawało ciekawe, że jednak jest ten nur podskórny, że w momencie, kiedy jest to wyrównywanie, że wątek indywidualności staje się bardzo ważny i że, że ta, cała, ta cała aura wokół Little Review która jest dosyć ciekawa, bo to mówimy o latach 50. o bitnikach, że oni stworzyli taką kulturę alternatywną. Natomiast mamy przykład, że to w latach 20. te kobiety już stworzyły, która była równie alternatywna, a może nawet bardziej alternatywna do pewnego stopnia, prawda? Tego przez, nawet przez swoją kobiecość, jeżeli już chcemy mówić prawda, o tych relacjach, prawda? Że to były kobiety, które jak gdyby zawładnęły tym językiem modernistycznym, a potem zrobiły z nim to, co chciały. To znaczy tak jak Hip zrobiła z niego mistycyzm, prawda? To wydaje mi się też bardzo ciekawe i że ten wątek indywidualny jest bardzo ważny, że, że, że on jest taka prywatność, która potem staje się publiczna w pewnym sensie, ale to jest pewien rodzaj publiczności. Natomiast etniczność jest, jest taką warstwą bardziej osobistą, a już narodowość to Rosjanie czy Polacy to w ogóle jest jak gdyby inny temat. Moje pytania są w związku z ostatnim referatem dotyczącym galerii Peggy Guggenheim i zacznę od takich bardzo szczegółowych. Pani pokazała zdjęcie, na którym jest Peggy Guggenheim, pierwsza osoba w skarpetki na nogach, potem dosyć wystrojona Teresa Żarnower i mężczyzna podpisany Markusz Bowley. Czy wiemy, kim jest Mar Markus Bowley? To jest pierwsze pytanie. Ah, he's a, uh, sorry. That was, I, I checked that. He's a, because it's obviously not De Niro. He, no, no. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a writer and critic. He wasn't a collector. He didn't, uh -huh. I checked, he hasn't written anything about Jarnova. Uh -huh. uh, and he's linked to Rutgers University. I see. Professor. So, by my reckoning, when I look at it, because, again, we only have a few photographs in the Newman... Um, archive has, uh, you know, press photos, if you like. But when I look at the photo, he looks to me like he doesn't realize he's in it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is just a, it's meant to be, it's not, he's not meant For to be. For me, it's you. incredibly important how these photographs from this uh, exhibition of function or work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I have seen three photographs, yours, uh, which is published at, uh, at the, the Susan Davidson book. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, and two which I was showing in my presentation, the, the one which I got from Janet uh, Abramovich, which most probably comes from, uh, from Zharnova uh, archive, the one with the, uh, the photograph of the gouache, uh, which uh, I managed to find in the Abramovich uh, collection. Uh, the, the second one, which is uh, well known and uh, well published, because it is published in your book, wrong with the microphone. Uh, yeah, it's working. And the, 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 the one which is, uh, the one which is uh, also in the, uh, in the Barnett Newman uh, collection, uh, 
uh, with this uh, text uh, for my friends uh, Annelie and mm. Bern uh, Barnett Newman mm. uh, and the date. And uh, what I found interesting and intriguing was the correspondence in the, uh, of uh, Annalie Newman, which I found in the Barnett Newman uh, collection, uh, foundation. Uh, and it looks like uh, Annalie was, uh, in a way, advertising Barnett uh, with this photograph, sending this photograph to a couple of people. So most probably it was couple, uh, copied a couple, couple of times. And also letters where she's uh, writing, short, very short letters, where she's uh, writing to, to various, uh, I guess, collectors, special people, uh, that Barnett Newman wrote a text uh, uh, a critique or a text for for uh, for the uh, Jardin Ver exhibition. So for me, it's really intriguing how these representations, how these photographs taken at the opening or during the exhibition, how they uh, function, how how they have this second life. Because you published this photograph, I found it at least in two two other archives. Uh, where from nobody knew. Uh, that's number one. Uh, and could you, uh, did you find any more photographs? Because I had really a big trouble to, uh, how to say, to, to find, to, uh, miałam duży kłopot, żeby znaleźć i żeby potwierdzić, które prace rzeczywiście były na tej wystawie u Peggy Guggenheim. Te prace mają tytuły, ale uh, właściwie na pracach znalazłam napisane tytuły tylko kilka razy. Jest przedstawienie, które się nazywa na przykład ZO z wystawy u Peggy Guggenheim. Właściwie udało mi się znaleźć tylko na 100% jeden, jeden gwarz, ponieważ jest na fotografii i jeden gwarz, ponieważ jest podpisany Bridge. I wczoraj pokazywałam taką dosyć lauzy fotografię, którą dostałam z archiwum Andrzeja Turowskiego, który z kolei dostał to od Dawida Żarnowera, czyli Europę, której oczywiście nigdzie nie znalazłam, bo szukałam jej we wszystkich zbiorach, to znaczy i w, w nowojorskich i oczywiście w Wenecji. Nikt o tym nigdy nie słyszał. Natomiast jak Państwo widzieliście, wczoraj pokazywałam z tym takim tekstem, że to jest ta praca, która została podarowana Pegi. To może być prawda, bo w spisach prac, które są pokazywane w Muzeum w San Francisco, są y, informacje o dwóch wypożyczeniach. Natomiast ta Europa już się tam w ogóle nie pojawia. Także y, zastanawiam się, czy istnieje jeszcze, bo pani pokazała dużo y, prac Żarnower, czy istnieje jeszcze szansa odnalezienia czegoś i identyfikacji po tych pani badaniach w, dotyczących galerii Peggy Guggenheim. Thank you. Um, I think uh, but I think one of the things I was um, this basically I mean the point is it's largely archaeological investigative research that we're doing, and the problem is you need that material for interpretation further. But it's both because of the time uh, of 1946 uh, and because of the lack, lack of documentation. This is I've had the same issue with the Guggenheim archives, but Venice and New York have made it quite clear that they don't have anything more and they've bent over backwards to help uh, me in many ways because they're, I mean, they, it's not that they're not, um, it's in their interest too. But the, it is, it is a, a problem for us and those of us who research this particular moment of arts history because we have, we're dealing with little traces the whole time and trying to map it together. And the only reason I referred to again the 97 Expo um, where they tried to bring together women who had exhibited in Guggenheim space was that they, they fell flat on their face in the sense that well, they could put this work, this work, um, but we can't recreate the works and we can't track down when they were sold and passed on, etc. So the same photographs in terms of, the, um, uh, I've only used the Newman and the Guggenheim archives, they're no more. It is where you try and look and you see the, uh, do you try and work out what it is compared to a thumbnail edition and try and map it out. But I presumed, which largely was why I was asking about the Abramovich, to what extent they had actual any more 
specific notes about titles and, and they don't. No. The awful thing is the titles are so important and yet for many of the images um, there's you know what you describe as um, a kind of repertoire of motifs which is why again for my purpose what I try to focus on is what does occur and the fact that they're obviously fabulously sculptural and monolithic and you've got sort of a influence of Léger, Matisse, etc. in terms of a lot of this figuration uh, and I didn't have time to do it in this. This is a shorter version of, of, um, uh, of an essay, but if you compare again her sculpture work and block work, this is again about a new medium exploring similar concerns um, with uh, softer, more primitivist forms, but that, that, that female form re keeps recurring, and I think that's interesting from my angle, let's say. And did you, uh, did you ever uh, contact uh, uh, Mr. Sharp, uh, who, who he's British, I think he is working as a curator in uh, Kunsthistorisches, and I think he was a ghost uh, researcher for Susan Davidson. Right. And yeah, uh, I was uh, I was in touch with him. I I, I was meeting him in Venice. I, I had a strange uh, email exchange, and in the end, he he never gave me any answers. So, Although we so almost I'll became friends. I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, I'll join, we'll join forces and I'll, I'll try and see if I get anything more out of Mr. Sharp and Let's share with try. you because, as I say, part of the excitement is whatever about the frame of rethinking this historical moment and uh, transnational ideas, we have, I mean, uh, we still have a responsibility to try and, uh, to find the, the art and the documents. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, when I, uh, when we look at the, uh, well, of the very obvious uh, images uh, of the Guggenheim, uh, well, uh, Peggy Guggenheim's uh, gallery, the, 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 the famous interiors and the famous divisions, etc., etc. I think that in a way, this almost banal, this uh, white cubes, but still with, uh, with the daylight mm -hmm. galleries, uh, are in a way very modern. Mm -hmm. uh, because, well, they are very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it's not a window shopping. It's, not a, uh, it's a gallery which sells, mm -hmm. but it's definitely not a window shopping mm -hmm. situation. And, uh, and they are so modest versus this very sophisticated, very designed, very, very special interiors uh, which, uh, which uh, Chrysler did uh, for, for the collection as a matter of fact. So I, I would uh, rather think about, well, in a positive way about these two modest spaces, the daylight and mm. the west. Mm. And uh, last but not least, uh, when I look at the images of, uh, well, gouaches of Jardover on the walls, I think that the works are relatively big for this space because they are 16. And they are gouaches. They are works on paper, mm. and works of on paper uh, never tend well un unless they are uh, enormous. They are either very modest or enormous, and I think that their size is quite reasonable. Well, I suppose I, I was uh, setting it up against the the collection proper in the Kiesler space. Yeah, yeah. But also, let's not forget that all the exhibitions were working with the same space, whether you were Pollock, whether you were Wahlberg, whether you were, um, whether you were Jarnover. But um, actually, it was Sonia Sekou who was meant to have the show in that space at that time. So I would, you couldn't have hung 16 gouaches in the two rooms, uh, mm. in the two spaces. It would have been, they would have Too been much. dwarfed. Yeah. So you've got to, I mean, a, a lot of the work I've done on exhibitions, the point is, again, that you've got to think very much ab about the politics of the space, both the logistics and the politics of the actual exhibition space. But all I was making the point about Kiesler is that this was, this was the most exciting space art Absolutely. of the century gallery. Absolutely. And it did to space and exhibitions and the selling and reviewing of art, it forced everybody into an avant-garde experience, whether they liked it or not. And look how Kiesler is, for example, using plywood. Sure, sure. It's, it's mm. gorgeous. It's so, so it's modern. It's uh, extra, well. So if, if any of us were in fantastic. New York at the time, it's where we wanted to, to show. So she knows, I mean, she knows uh, Barnett Newman, Guggenheim notes that, and she. 
and she knows Peggy Guggenheim. So, and Peggy Guggenheim is, is finding and promoting women at various levels in their career. Um, but that's, again, it's just an almost normalized, let's say, the... the uh, and the, the fact that Peggy Guggenheim uh, continues with this women network sure. is that she's sure. uh, recommending her to, to the woman director of the museum so, in yes, San so Francisco. I, the last image, yes, uh, so but still more. it's a yeah. kind of networking because sure. still is commenting on Barnett Newman's mm. Uh, mm. text and mm. still is exhibiting in San Francisco mm. and also mm. at Peggy. Mm. So it is about a little bit about networking. Mm. Mm. And that's a different, again, a model, I think, if we think about it. With a couple of models. Exactly. Thank Good. you very much, Good. Professor Kimbo. Yes, it's my it's my turn. So um, <laughs> you, um, I mean, I really liked your uh, your your uh, presentation, but I have a question. Um, 1946 is quite uh, it's quite important, um, and uh, it's not on. I don't know how to put this. Uh, Greenberg in 1946 uh, writes an article uh, for the Nation, and he's, he's talking about uh, uh, the greatness of uh, Gertrude Bearer, mm. who is a woman working in in uh, New York, and he says literally in the in the text that she's the best artist in America. Right, mm. so that's one thing that uh, we are, we cannot forget. Uh, then what happens to her? That's another story. But at that time, uh, there is a group of uh, people working around the new iconograph uh, who are. Uh, very, who is, who is very well known and uh, uh, with uh, several women working and pretty well uh, described. So that's one thing. The, the other thing is that when we talk about uh, art critics, I think I would like to know more about, like for example, Mike Bride and some of the, you had some of those uh, uh, yeah. traditional newspaper people mm -hmm. who are really reactionary. Yeah. I mean, they would be, yeah. they, are, they were so out of it, right? That, uh, that it's difficult to kind of take them seriously. So we have to kind of be, uh, it right. seems to me, kind of you know, mention that, that to mm. describe them. Um, and the other thing is that I think um, uh, what I was trying to say in my talk is about the, um, why the, the, um, uh, the uh, disappearance of uh, concrete art or concrete abstraction and something like this. It happens, something like that happens in the States as well. They have two things that kind of uh, disintegrate is uh, geometric art and Rice Pereira, for example, mm -hmm. uh, she's quite well known, uh, yeah. but, but at some mm -hmm. point she has a description, she has an interview and she describes her work like a, like the old 20s kind mm -hmm. of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, mathematics and mm -hmm. this and that, and they don't want to hear this stuff mm -hmm. anymore. So, mm -hmm. so that's, the, that's her problem. Um, and uh, also the, um, the, the, the fact that Surrealism is also in trouble in, in New York at the time, right? Uh, so because of kinds of uh, region political, but also because of, the, of their politics. Um, and it seems to me that in what you mentioned is around 48, when 40, in 48 in America, uh, it, that does not happen in France, but, in, but uh, in the context of the beginning of the Cold War, uh, American artists have to, for the art criticism, from you know the most advanced art criticism and the Museum of Modern Art in particular, and after the problem with the Boston Institute, who wanted to have uh, different types of uh, of art production, in particular, they are interested in, in expressionism, and but the Museum of Modern Art it says absolutely not. Expressionism is too uh, old-fashioned, and in a sense, they say it's too German, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want to have that. So 48 is the year where the, you have a complete transformation because of the Cold War, the beginning of the Cold War. And you cannot, uh, for those type of critics, have women uh, being shown as very important because a woman at that time, as you know, they will not be able to fight Stalin. And, uh, and all the guys are kind of uh, put together, <laughs> as you say, they cannot yeah, do yeah. it. And the way they, they describe the French artist is just like that. They are, eff they are effeminate. Fe effeminate. Yes, but this and, is... Uh, and, and, and then yeah. there, is no, there is no way out for them to be, to be present again. Very tough, I suppose, no? But this is, this is exactly how one Breton returns in 46. They have the exhibition in 47 at the Galerie Meg in, mm -hmm. in Paris, and it's deemed because it explores, it brings a lot of this Kiesler design, is it? So this is where I'm saying it's back and mm -hmm. forth, and we mm -hmm. shouldn't forget that. Li it's like Duchamp, but the effeminate uh, tag is this idea that they weren't, they were inactive during the war. Who the mm -hmm. hell are they to come back? But right. again, the military language is being used 
both sides of the waters in that sense. Um, but uh, I think what the point is, the gender, the gender politics comes into the language as well as the reception, as well as into the fact of, is it actually a oh, female yeah, no, artist? So this yeah. is the problem that it's not just about looking at women artists and balancing them up. It's the fact that the language is so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know, gendered in that its I, context. That, that I way. agree. And, and also, for example, if you look at, uh, in an article in 1948 in, uh, in Art New, no, 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 in Newsweek, um, the, you have a, a photograph of uh, Mathieu, Mathieu, yeah, who is yeah. the, who is the kind of the essence, essence of gesticulation, mm -hmm. uh, and he does all his job by jumping up and down, and he's represented in this magazine as an odalisk mm -hmm. on the floor, like mm -hmm. this with his, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that the way he, it shows mm -hmm. that he didn't understand a thing mm -hmm. about what was going on at the mm -hmm. time, but uh, it's a, it's a very, th this is the the key moment. is forty eight. It's like mm -hmm. a complete transformation. Uh, and I think uh, Peggy w had; she was absolutely right to get out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you and know, it's, it's, it's understood. Uh, yeah. And everything yeah. she thought—I mean, she was disappointed, yeah. basically, with the art right. of the century at this point, and yeah. what her battle had had got it's lost into something else. No, uh, there is there is also something interesting uh, apart from the gender identity. I think you know that in a way uptown, because there is a geography of uh, Manhattan too, or New mm. York, right? Mm. They are uptown, right? Mm. Uh, so, in a way, uh, she fits into some kind of a bourgeois culture, sort of European and bourgeois, mm. you know, and that's very significant too. You know, she's not an avant-garde artist anymore, even if uh, Barnett Newman, you mm. know, kind of puts her in that position. In terms of how um, Peggy Guggenheim functions and, and, and people who are around her, I mean, suddenly she's sort of bourgeoisized, right? mm. and, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a major issue too, because we can sort of polarize it uh, gender-wise, but there is also the class kind of issue, which suddenly she's put in a position which, uh, which kind of suits her, but at the same time doesn't belong to her sort of identity, the, the pre-New York identity. Mm. You know, that's why uh, I, I think that's, that's important too, to think about it, because we, we tend to ignore the class issue, but there is a sure. class component to it. And, you know, and also if we talk about the, the polarization of New York, uh, I mean, there was the uptown crowd and downtown crowd, which is just a little bit, uh, the, the Cedar Bar, you know, it's mm -hmm. a little bit later, mm -hmm. but, but the out, uptown crowd, which is um, actually Jewish, you know, like Rotko and Newman mm -hmm. and all of them, they have this salon, the uptown salon, mm -hmm. right? The downtown salon where Pollock and, and the Kooning uh, get drunk and, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a different game. So, so it's but, important yeah. to... Yeah, but this is, at the, this is exactly it. This is at the time when we have a shift from uh, uh, Bohemia to avant-garde. And Bohemia is a, is a kind of different world, is where, where you don't think or you don't imagine that you will make it and you, you, you just, as we said, it's a class, tr it's a class difference. Mm -hmm. But once you move into the avant-garde with, a, with a, a, a system of gallery system, America, New York didn't have that before. It was very, very small. But you have this kind of an explosion of the, a new system because the economy is huge. Uh, lots of people are making lots of money, and uh, and they needed to have this kind of uh, uh, recogn image recognition. They know the French system, the way Paris function, and they, they try to copy. Uh, Greenberg is very clear about this. We have to become and to get on that level when a culture like France has the, has the possibility to to support and to love somebody like Matisse, who is completely out but, to lunch. But he's, what he's about floating, uh, right? Rosenberg? We have to float, But what about says. Rosenberg? I mean, he already declared that Paris uh, failed, In right? 1940, yes. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah. So. But you, so you have to reconstruct some kind, and mm. all those artists who are there living in a bohemian case, I would say, during the war, before the war, and so on, by the 1947, it started to be the construction of a, what we call an avant-garde, which is a bourgeois, a bourgeois, a bourgeois, un bourgeoisement of the of uh, of because the when when you compare when you compare Hedda Stern uh, mm. and uh, Teresa to mm. uh, Jane Heap and you know who is mm. a butch like this you know and, mm. and and all these women they they are really spectacular in their kind of eccentricity mm. here we have very well dressed ladies with hats and you know I mean with a purse Hedda Stern comes you know yes. to that picture with yes. a purse you know she has a wonderful coat very European but style. But what are the men wearing? Yeah. The point is we. The yeah. men are all wearing banal 
Suits, ties, that's what they right. always tell my students. Entre yeah. Bechon wears a green tweed suit in every photograph. How radical. I mean, but the point but is... That well, but, but, we but, did, of course, but, but that was intentional. They, yes, they, but that's yes, saying they, because but they were rebelling against that exhibition. Genre the is from a generation Museum. where they're not, and even the women's realists, only mm. Frida Kahlo is someone who's coming in full uh, indigenous dress, and all the press talk about is how she looks and her mm. dress. This is fabulous for her market, fabulous for the shows. This is when the, the big Mexican show, Amoma. Right. But this is, again, this is where they're looking for other sort of poles of attention. But for the women like Leonora Carrington and Orfini, all of whom were very good at dressing up, masquerading, etc., not during the war, not at this time, mm -hmm. when they're already working for 10, 20 years, and they want yeah. recognition. So. I but think what does it, what does it say that. about her sort of fitting into New York in terms of how she's presented, you know, as a as a person? Because you stress this kind of woman so. who has no money. Who, uh, well, you mean literally in terms of herself? Her self, self image. Image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, by all accounts, in terms of correspondence, I mean she's wrought. She's financially. Uh, hard up, etc. So I think that's. Uh, but okay. she's trying to compromise. What's perhaps I was thinking more in terms of your point about class and divisions within New York. Right. This is the time when Guggenheim's um, autobiography comes out, right. and she asked Barnett Newman to review it, and Barnett Newman doesn't review it. And in the again in the archives, you have kind of his his little doodles and his sketches about it, and he's trying to think about it. But he says she's presenting an image of America that America doesn't want. I think that's as telling about why she has to leave, uh, and about this crunch over. Was he the only? Uh, was he the one who said no. that he was the only man who didn't sleep with her? No, but it, no. well, this is <laughs> <laughs> this is part of no. Well, he wasn't, but again, the no. But there was one. Yes, uh, somebody is, said it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was. But again, if you think that's what's more interesting, the women you're talking about, the women of the left bank in Paris and New York. I mean, this was this that's was a lesbian I mean. circle, so they didn't have to deal with that kind of the lives and loves of Peggy Guggenheim. The point was, everyone said she slept with her artist. She who did she sleep with? She was living a. A bohemian life in that sense, and yet yeah. she's a Jewish heiress who can afford to buy art and open a gallery. So there's a lot of contradictions within a lifestyle and her but financial. There a, but, there, but there is a problem. There is two things. There is there is this kind of everyday life, right? But yeah. also you have also the the image that you wanted to as a culture that you wanted to produce mm. internationally. Mm. That's what also that's what we're talking about. So mm. in that case, whatever she does. She would not fit into mm. this new, th th which this is new. very decided and very described in 1948 by the MoMA, by the Guggenheim Museum uh, against Boston. They describe exactly what the new image of America should be. And so, mm. and a lot of people do not fit. And in surrealism, do, does not fit at all, also. So it's not only that. And also, the macho image that you have to have, mm. the individualistic image, because individualism means, means, uh, um, uh, 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 capitalism, you know. I mean, it's pretty clear there in the text. You read it; it's just mind-boggling what they do when they write. It took uh, the the fight started in '48, and they write a a, a, uh, a proposal or a, a pamphlet in 1950, where the Boston say, "Okay, okay, well, I, I, okay, I'm I'm going with you now. It's it's okay." But if you read that stuff, you know. I mean, you see that uh, for three yes. years, what was going on and yeah. all the, the strings that they were pulling in the back and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So but for some people, there is no chance whatsoever. But mm -hmm. would you say that she's sort of kind of uh, contributing to the bourgeoisation of, of, of the avant-garde in but some way? Yeah, but I think the avant-garde is, is itself a, a bourgeois sure. system. It's a bourgeois effect. Uh, I mean, there is no way. Uh, well, that's, that's the, the irony. Is the, but well, that's the co when we think, I mean, when we think that the avant-garde is against the system, it's a kind of a fallacy. It's a naivety. Well, well but that's by, by the time they're successful as an avant-garde, they're co-opted. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the. Then there are new avant-garde. When you started to get yeah, into yeah. the avant-garde, you know what you're doing. Yes. Yeah, mam jeszcze jedną uwagę dotyczącą tego w reprezentacji ubrania. I też tego, o czym Państwo w tej chwili mówicie, no bo była mowa o awangardzie i burżuazji. Żarnower to nie, to nie tylko jej inicjatywa w wydawanie bloku, to również jej rodzinne pieniądze. A rodzina miała dużą firmę zatrudniającą 50 osób szyjącą ubrania. Ale ja chciałam zakończyć jeszcze inną rzeczą a propos ubrania. Otóż, kiedy Żarnower zwraca się do Hayasu o pomoc, jest w depresji, nie ma pieniędzy na czynsz, 
mówi, że ona generalnie pogardza pieniędzmi, ale prosi o zapomogę finansową na kupno kapelusza, torebki, butów i dostaje te pieniądze. I taki urzędnik z tego hajasu, który z nią przeprowadza rozmowę, a potem robi z tego notatkę, mówi, że to się nie trzyma kupy, że ona z jednej strony mówi, że pogardza pieniędzmi, a teraz musi sobie kupić wszystkie nowe ubrania. A ona wtedy mówi, no tak, ale ja jeszcze jestem kobietą. Ja chciałem that's zapytać, uh, um, would you like to comment on that? Or? No, that's lovely. That's I have a question to uh, Professor Givo, uh, just a very um, short one, because you, you mentioned that Celtic uh, compound in the kind of uh, justification for abstraction after the war. But is that, uh, can you relate that to the pre-war, the sort of Celtic revival, especially in the 30s, it's very nationalistic trend in yeah. French. Mm. Yeah. So, or rather, this is more like Marek said, that someone goes into theosophy, goes kind of away from, uh, you know, into uh, kind of a next step of away from reality. Or this is very much a nationalistic uh, context. Uh, well, I, I would say it's a nationalistic uh, in that particular time, but it's very different from the first one from the, uh, the 30s, yes, totally different, because the 30s was also um, uh, Celts were, were, were like um, with, the, with the past, but also with uh, nature, with peasantry and so on. I mean, now we have, uh, it's, the, it's the opposite. I mean, they are trying to recreate, to find roots in a sense, but not in the same way as it was done in the 1930s. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a, it's, it's a city, uh, y you find roots, but they are not, I don't know how to explain that, they are not the roots of the, co of the countryside, is a city. So this is like the proto-hippie, uh, proto-new age situation, mm. kind of theosophy related? No, I would not, no, no, you, no, know, too far, you, know, you know what, I think, I think that what they did that was a completely, it was a kind of half a joke. Okay. Uh, they, they, they realized that uh, they had to fight back this kind of idea that, um, that on, in the first hand, Tapier is uh, relating, uh, he wants to do a kind of a global group, uh, and he included, includes the Americans in it. You know, in one of his, uh, is uh, the, the f when he invites Jackson Pollock in 1952 to come to Paris, uh, he has an exhibition there, and the, the title of his catalog is uh, Pollock with us. Right? Mm -hmm. It means exactly what he means. I mean, it means that he thinks that he's going to include the Americans into his circle to run the world again, right? I mean, he, he has not understood what was going yeah. on in the world. So the other one, uh, uh, Etienne, really uh, is aware of all the political connection. He's a lot more sophisticated because of the, his friendship with Breton as well. Breton is not a dummy. By the way, Breton, <laughs> when uh, Breton comes back in France in 1946, the first article he writes in a, in a Juin magazine is to say, uh, right now what we have to do is to transform completely the way we are thinking because I've seen the American Indian uh, society in where the women are all, they are all directing uh, they are in, they are in power in a sense, yeah, sure. and with yeah. with them, with women in power, we will never have war anymore. He was wrong with that, but anyway, he, he, I mean that's ideologically, it was ex extraordinary forceful kind of a statement about about France. But when he never uh, in, he, he was never interested in abstraction, for example, Breton. He's only by the late by fift, early fifties that he started to realize, well, maybe abstraction, you know, because uh, the Americans are sending all this and all that. So he gets in relationship with uh, Charles Etienne, and both of them do this after seeing a huge show at the Bibliothèque Nationale of money, of coins. And that's when they, that's when they realize, you know, you know, say, half jokingly, hey, man, we've done it, you know, this is it. And for them to describe the, the, uh, the Americans, just like the Greek, who who stole the entire world, it's fantastic. So, and it worked for some time, for, like, for a while, you know, for maybe a year, uh, people in France were talking about that. We, we still have the roots, but they didn't never listen to Voice of America, for example, which was too bad because they would have learned <laughs> a lot of things. So.
I so I think it's half a joke. It's, since we are closing on Jarnova, in a way, it's important perhaps to 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 mention also the the sort of the question of trauma, you know, and the way how trauma sort of uh, visualizes itself. And I think uh, you know when you think about uh, Jarnova and. Um, let's say Rothko, you know, and what happens when they react to a particular trauma caused by the war, by the mm -hmm. Holocaust, right? What, what, uh, what um, um, uh, Rothko does, he moves away from figuration, right? He, mm -hmm. he considers figuration kind of not good enough to represent that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of distress that he's going through and it's kind of living in a way through his imagination when as she in some way, you know, sort of goes back to figuration like Bacon, mm. let's say, like Giacometti, and mm. that's where it's interesting, using uh, you know, surrealist but in a, in a broader sense to kind of deal with that issue of trauma, mm. right, which, mm. uh, which I think is very important in, in, in understanding that work and, and the split that happened, mm. you know. And the trauma is even maybe deeper because of, uh, of the fact that it's witnessed from far away. You know, there is this wonderful uh, text that we discussed sort of informally. Uh, Hannah Arendt, she wrote in 1942, she wrote uh, uh, an essay which is called We Refugees, mm -hmm. where she talks about, um, um, discusses why people committed suicide, uh, Jewish people uh, committed suicide uh, in New York, sort of, uh, being away from the immediate danger and yet not being able to cope with it. And uh, I think in, in Jarnover's sort of fate, that, that's also interesting. We can look at, at her exhibition as a moment when she, she, she just began to, you know, to flourish. But on the other hand, maybe that's after that show, there was that void that, that, that pushed her, you know, towards, um, you know, the, the, the trauma sort of materialized itself. I don't know, this is just, um, you know, this is just a big question mark, but, uh, but I, I think the, the question of how she internalized her, you know, experience and then how it materialized itself in art, it's, it's a very important aspect of understanding her work and, and the, the, the changes that, that, that occurred. But in that, in that sense, uh, in that sense, we have also to have to think about Gorky, who kills himself in 1948 as well, exactly. about the same problems yeah. too. So, it's yeah, I think it's a it's a very interesting problem, and that's why I thought I brought up uh, 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 Fautrier because oh. he was confronted with the same kind of yes. issue. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to, I would to say is is less is less um, what you, what's the word you use um, trauma. trauma trauma yes traumatic because for him. And I think we have to understand that you look at those pictures and people talk about war and about you know the, the disease and all that stuff. But also, all his work, in a sense, is very disgusting because he's ex extremely erotic. And people don't talk about that. But he, he brings all his work from the 1920s where he paints uh, uh, you know, a female vagina like a Rembrandt pig, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he paints... Uh, uh, birds, like also related to females. So for him, this, that violence he's describing is very actually uh, uh, sensual for him. And so we have to take that into account. And uh, I didn't have time to do this, but we have we we, we yes. Microphone. But but this is Milada Stijinska is f maybe you you ask first, and the new end that will be the end okay. of the course. So so my uh, small remark, uh, which uh, well, it, my. Uh, Parę słów, ponieważ w związku z tym, co, co właśnie powiedział pan e, Bartelik, e, kiedy rozmawiałam z Abramowiczami, czyli tą daleką rodziną, która ma pracę Żarnower i zapytałam, czy oni, bo oni mieli na, na ścianach powieszony blok w ramkach, e, który potem sprzedali, także już, już blok nie wisi, ale mieli gwasze. Wielu prac się pozbywali, niszczyli, wyrzucali, natomiast te gwasze zostały. No i oczywiście powiedzieli, że one są takie brzydkie i takie straszne, że oni nigdy nie chcieliby mieć ich na, na ścianie. I ta trauma Żarnower jest autentyczna. Ona traci w, w zagładzie część rodziny, ona jest cały czas w kontakcie z przeróżnymi ludźmi, w, którzy już potem są rozsiani po świecie, którzy też 
odczuwają traumę i też, też stracili bliskich. W listach do, do Temersonów, które, które przychodzą na jej adres do Lizbony, ona jest jakby skrzynką kontaktową między ich rodziną, która jest już wtedy w getcie, a Franciszką i Stefanem, którzy mają bardzo niepewne adresy. Także ona jest cały czas i wszyscy, którzy z, przychodzą do jej studia, czy to jest pani Korsak w Kanadzie, czy to jest Złotowski w Nowym Jorku, mówią o tej traumie, o rysunkach i ona zresztą mówi o tym też w tych rozmowach w Hajasie. Także ta trauma towarzyszy jej bardzo, bardzo mocno. No tak, bo to jest, ja, ja widziałem te wszystkie prace, tak jak pani w Nowym Jorku i pierwsze, co mnie uderzyło w nich, to było ten ogromny, ładunek emocjonalny, który może jak się ogląda w reprodukcji, to nawet się tego do końca tak nie widzi, bo się racjonalizuje. Natomiast jeżeli jest ten fizyczny obiekt i, i, i te, te kartki, one mają swoją fizyczność, prawda? I, i ten tusz i, i gwarz, one wszystko, kolory poza tym są niezwykłe. Tam ta, ta czerwień się wylewa prawie jak krew, prawda? Tego czerń jest, jest jakąś tak... No można, można jak gdyby na różne sposoby o tym mówić, no bo to, to zależy od, od, od tego, ale wydaje mi się, że ten wątek tego, tego silnego szoku, który zaważył na tym, że tego i to jest ciekawe, że, że ten szok został włączony w kulturę burżuazyjną w, w 57. ulicy w pewnym sensie, prawda? No wtedy akurat nie było innych galerii, czym to, to nie można mówić, że to była, była Soho albo Chelsea, prawda? Ale tego, ale mimo wszystko, że że, że właśnie, że czy ta trauma się sprzedaje teraz, bo, bo to... Bo to e, Obawiam bo to... się, że tak. <laughs> Zwłaszcza dzisiaj. Ale ostatnie pytanie. Ostatnie pytanie. Uh, I know we're ready for lunch, so I'll keep this short. I just think it's fascinating in terms of uh, Serge, your kind of narrativization of this national project in France that's still so very strong in the way that it's completely excised and erased um, other other tendencies, uh, ones that had to do with other national projects in the 40s. For example, Isidore Issou and uh, Gabriel Pomeron's uh, uh, construction of uh, Saint-Germain-de-Prés de as a kind of ghetto, and um, or the question of Fautrier's um, representation of the Jewess and of Sarah, which couldn't really be absorbed into this kind of national project around a kind of French salvaging of their own image mm -hmm. of the, you know, not collaborators, but of course kind of resistance and all of that. And the, the ongoing dominance or hegemony of that narrative has really uh, erased, in my opinion, uh, kind of uh, a lingering, a lingering difference that was still very much possible between 43 and let's say 51 around the Chaplin affair, um, which was that split in the Lettriste mm -hmm. and was that kind of last moment of an international other avant-garde. And I, I'm just curious if you could perhaps um, reflect on why that national that narrative that you kind of retold us is still so strong. <laughs> I think, well, I retold, it, I retold uh, the story because that's the, that is the um, the way the the French wanted to uh, us. I mean, the rest of the world to uh, to attract somebody like Izu is very. Uh, as I mentioned in another talk that um, uh, when Pot Clash so, uh, you know comes out, for example, the discourse is absolutely violent against America and against France. I mean, it's a very violent stuff. Uh, but they try to. But they are, they don't have an impact because they published a, a booklet that is 50, 50 copies. So what you have, yes, you have a, 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 a major dominant discourse from the French. They wanted to, for example, they wanted to emphasize what I saw. I mean, I showed that the Manessier type of work, they want to have this. Uh, with um, with Fautrier, they try to some degree some people, but it doesn't really go too far. But then you have all kinds of other of their discourse. I mean, you mentioned Sacha Madepré. That's the most interesting part, where you have lots of immigration from uh, from the states, from Lat from Latin America, also from uh, from the Eastern Europe. But those are not. Even if we talk that we are an international place, we don't talk about them. Those those are kind of they stay in this. Uh, um, uh, I don't know the word I the word I use. I forget all the time. Uh, 
Bohemia. <laughs> stays in that Bohemia, and they, they create a very intense and very extraordinary culture, but we don't talk about it. They are not visible, even in the, in the press. And you know, even with the, with the Situationist, it's just very small group, and you have to wait until uh, late 60s or middle 60s to, to have, to have a, to, to can hear those, you can hear those voices. And the only one that is trying to do something is, again, is a, a form of surrealist. They are trying to, and the Surrealist Revolutionnaire, for example, is a group that comes out with Jaguer uh, and Dautremont, and those are trying to bring bring uh, artists from outside. They are the ones who, who really wanted to continue the international ideas, but they are rejected because they want to be Marxist and Surrealist at the same time. So by 48, again, 48 is an incredible date, they are, they are uh, eradicated uh, because they are attacked by Breton on one side and by the communists on the other side. So they want to be both, and it doesn't work. But so these voices, the voices are all, all kind of erased, yeah. But just in terms of mechanisms of visibility and mechanisms, kind of gatekeeping mechanisms, which is what we saw in the other two presentations as well, how do you differentiate then the French uh, gatekeeping mechanisms? What is it, it? Is it because the state kind of program is so strong? Yeah, yes. I think the state, the administration, and the, because the, the museums. In, that's what another story. That the the, the, the structure of a French uh, art world is very nas national. I mean, the the government direct the stuff, so they hire the people, and it's all the same ones. And it's it's like a kind of after a while, it's like a mafia group. So then you have an avant-garde or a bohemia who attacks this. In the States, what, what, what the strength of the States, what, in a funny way, uh, maybe you're not going to like this, but is like the free enterprise stuff. Like the museum is a free enterprise. They say, this is my museum. I do what I want. And I have so much money that can, I can force you to, to do this or to no, force, you, force you to believe me, right? But in France, you cannot do that. In France, it's, they are all on the same plane. It's very difficult to have, in the administration, to have a differences. Over there, you had the Boston, who thinks this way, the modern art doing a different way, and then the Museum of Modern Art get in, in relationship with all the other private institutions, and they say, this is what we wanted to defend, this idea, and so on. In France, in France, they, well, they, they did this, but they did the wrong way, in a sense. Everybody in the avant-garde or in the Bohemia was saying to them, be careful, don't go there. This is uh, to reconstruct uh, the, you know, the old world. It's going to be old world. I mean, I'm not showing, I didn't show you here, for example. In 1946, there is a magazine called Paris Lives that has been published in English in order to, kind of to, to, to um, uh, convince Anglo-Saxon world that Paris is back in the world with all the luxury, it's all about luxuries, about fashion, about uh, uh, the traditions, about even colonialism. They show how great colonials they are. They, un they misunderstood completely the world. And so that, we can make fun of them. You know, you say, Jesus Christ, you guys, I mean. And you know what? Nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah. I think we have to Thank finish you. at this point. Thank you very much.